And we're live. Yeah. Uh, nothing like trying to do all that on the phone. Uh, you felt a lot easier. And we're live. Yeah. So, uh, what's up, everyone? I'm just uh, enjoying this beautiful Sunday afternoon here in uh, Rogersburg, up in Virginia. But I don't know. It's a flying day. It's a flying day. And uh, usually on a weekday, it's a shit show around here. But it's uh, you know, the weekend, so there's actually parking. Uh, um, let's see who's all in here. here. I haven't done a live in a long time. Uh, I don't really tell if I I'm here. Uh, it's just, uh, no, I don't know why the camera keeps focusing on it now. Every time I've got a video, See if that makes a difference. No, no, still, uh, still wanting to focus. So I don't know. Maybe it's in, in the actual camera settings. I know I turned off autofocus mobile settings before, uh, but it's probably because it's really bright behind me. So uh, I can't really do anything about that right now. Um, yeah. So I swear I come on live, maybe talk about some of the struggles and um, things I'm going through right now. Uh, and, you know, just to uh, put it out there, whether or not you have a new truck, an old truck, uh, shit's still going to happen to you as an owner-operator. It really doesn't make any difference. I mean, even if, let's say I still had my 9400, you know, I might be in a better spot than I am now. But to be quite honest, that was an old piece of shit truck. And uh, I got a dirt cheap during the uh, pandemic compared to whatever, compared to what other people were paying. So, uh, yeah, I guess I got my money's worth out of it. You know, uh, if it did break down as much, I probably would have done better. So, I don't know. I Like I said, I'm just coming on here to kill time to let people know, you know I'm still alive, I guess you could say. And I'm still trying to, I don't know, eventually put together a podcast. But it's, you know, as much as I try to be out there and, um, uh, I don't know, just let everybody know cameras going to destroy the hell out of it. Uh, my chain. Uh, 
if I had current shares, I'd pull current shares. But <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't doing that earlier before I hit record. So uh, I was just sitting uh, going live. So uh, you know, I'm wondering if maybe it's the vibration. We'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, it must be, must be the point. Man, uh, talk about professionalism. So, like I was saying, uh, you know, as a, I guess we'll kind of get here. Oh, I'm not 100 but you know, as a as a man, a family man, and, you know, responsibilities and everything. Like like a lot of us out here that are, you know, just trying to start our own business. Uh, you know, maybe get ahead somehow. Not not necessarily. I mean, it depends where you work, but it's not necessarily. You know, don't want to work for the man. Uh, you know, it's kind of hard to. I don't know. Be truthful with yourself and I come out there and say, you know, what's going on. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not doing good right now. Uh, if you, you know, the one post I made earlier, uh, you know, the things that everyone, when you know, they say, be an owner operator, you're going to make more money, you're going to be able to be more in control of home time and everything. They don't tell you that, you know, it is a business and businesses don't always make money. Uh, they're not always profitable. And the same thing goes to being an owner-operator. Uh, you know, if you don't stick the money away during the good times, uh, or let's say uh, you have a lot of bad times in a row, you know, that can uh, that can weigh heavily on you. Um, and you know, like I said, if you're a family man, you know, it also weighs heavily on your family. So, I don't know. I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to go go down the road here that don't let don't let I mean I might have been uh, I might have been a few before uh, I don't I don't ever try to get on here and tell someone to get a proper and that you know you're gonna make money hand over this kind of what but I know other guys do and you know people just get they they see the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, wherever they're at, whether they're on whether they're a company driver struggling or just just your everyday normal person that's struggling and sees that, you know, it's easy to get your class A and then hop in here and then you know, they, they come and start telling you a lease, uh, you know, a lease purchase driver, um, you know, become an owner-operator in it. And, uh, you know, it just holds up, it just grabs people and they can see the money. They don't, they don't plan, they don't look, uh, look any farther than, you know, their first settlement or whatnot. And they just assume that, you know, maybe their second or third settlement by that time, maybe they're making money. They assume that it's always going to be like that, especially if you're a lease purchase operator. A lot of these companies, you know, for a month, they'll delay your payment uh, for a few weeks. So you just think you're going to be rolling, you know, uh, hand over fist money. So, but I don't know. I don't really have anything. They stripped it, so I'm just, uh, the audio is choppy. Is that better? It might be, I was going to say, if it's the, might be my internet too, because uh, I, I have it set up here on the TV and I know it's getting a little scrambled. All right, thanks. There you go. Thanks, to Jack and Nova. But um, all right. Since that was probably pretty choppy, and someone's probably going to uh, listen to this, uh, let me go go on to say again. Like you know, I try not to bullshit anybody. I try to be truthful. And you know, it's hard being a a man. Uh, well, I mean, I guess anybody, but. <sighs> But, you know, being a man that has a family, it's important and everything, and you're, you're an owner-operator and things just aren't going your way, and you expect it, well, not me per se, but other people expect the things to go 
uh, in a certain direction. They see all these people on YouTube uh, talking about the money they're making. And that they, you know, most people never really throw out the bad times, uh, you know, when they're doing these videos. They either they're in a bad mood, which I, I gotta admit, there's there's times like, like even me trying to tiptoe around this conversation. There's times where, you know, you just know things are bad and and they just keep getting worse, and you just don't want to put anything out on YouTube. You don't want to you don't want to talk about it. Uh, it's not necessary that you want to hide things from people. It's just that uh, you don't have the motivation. Um, you know, when, when things are going bad. And, and I think that, you know, that, that kind of sucks a little bit, especially when people are watching you and they're expecting, you know, or they're, you know, they're expecting to get the gist on how, you know, being an owner operator is or, or just being in the trucking industry is. And they don't ever really see the real side. Um, the days that, you know, you just don't want to get out of bed. You want to sit here in the truck because, you know, the day before was a total disaster. And, you know, it, it's probably just going to get worse from there or that, you know, you're at another shitty shipper or that you're running behind. And a lot of people just don't don't really put that out there. So, you know, I guess that's what I'm going to try to do here as much as I kind of reluctantly want to. Uh, I guess, you know, if I was outside looking in, would I say necessarily I'm a failure right now? Well, I'm still in the truck. I'm still pushing through this. Uh, I probably would have thought I was a failure, you know, when the truck, uh, my old 2900, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, 9400 blew up. But hey, you know, like I said, I did, I sold my pickup truck to do this. I, I just kept going. It was the best thing I I could see for myself at the time. I couldn't get a loan to rebuild the old truck uh, engine. Nobody wanted to give it to me because the market collapsed. The truck really wasn't worth anything. Uh, you know, it was worth like ten thousand dollars, fifteen thousand dollars, probably the average market value uh, if it was running and you know, in decent shape. And just even now, uh, I I ended up junking it for like twenty five hundred bucks and. You know, I sat there and thought about, you know, because I'm still technically paying on the old truck. So I guess technically I'm not failing if you think about it. So I'm still paying about a thousand dollars a month on the old truck loan. All right. I still have like now 15,000 left on it and I'm paying for this truck at the same time. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. You know, I, I have a humongous between the two, the old truck and this truck, I have a huge truck payment and I'm not making any money as, uh, like I said, if you look at the, I want to punch this phone, hits this camera. I can see right here. I, I got it on the TV and it's going in and out, in and out. No, Starline, I don't, I don't need, I'm not like, I don't need no money. I'm not hurt. Like, I mean, I'm, you know, hit, hits hit the fan, but it's, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't need it real. Um, there's other guys on here that have it a lot worse than I do. I mean, uh, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, I have other abilities, I guess, to step back on to make reasonably good money. And then some of these guys are, you know, they came from Walmart you know, being a CSA or something and they got their CDL and they're just getting taken advantage of the whole time by uh, a mega carrier. And, you know, they're, uh, they're fighting with their old lady. Uh, my, me and my old lady have been through this many of times before. So, I mean, it's kind of like she's just used to it. Uh, this is trucking. Uh, you know, she probably would like it if I get out, you know, would get out. But then again, like I said, when times are really good and I'm not having bad breakdowns and, and luck, you know, behind me, you know, at, at this point, it's all, I don't know, anybody that's ever listened to some of my lives or listened to some of the information I've given out uh, knows I kind of, you know, have some bit of business knowledge or some kind of business sense behind me. In fact, that, like I said, the one time I almost did make it, I had two employees and everything, and I just ran into bad luck. And it's just been continuously bad luck, I would say, since, since the early 2000s. And then prior to that, I had bad luck. Let's see, I had a 
Cascadia that blew up on me. I, I literally put 15 or 20, no, uh, no, I put like 12,000 miles on that truck, maybe 10 to 12,000 miles on it. And it blew up, and Cummins didn't want to warranty it. Uh, the aftermarket warranty didn't want to cover it. Uh, eventually, I ended up contacting the dealership I bought it from, and they talked to Freightliner, which is, I guess, uh, Daimler or whatnot. Uh, and they took the truck back. I lost my 25000 or $30,000 deposit, you know, uh, down payment on the truck. And uh, they took the truck back, uh, made my loan whole, and uh, probably put a rebuilt engine in it. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm going off on a, a, a totally separate. I mean, I guess I'm just trying to explain. But, you know, things, things continuously can go wrong in trucking, and a lot of people end up dealing with it. Um, run a team and eat ramen. Yes, Marilyn. Uh, well, I guess I could try doing that. It's, um, let's see, Lagom. Do you, uh, do you run your own authority? Not right now. Uh, I was kind of planning on it before. Uh, yeah, I was kind of planning on it before shit like, hit the fan, I guess, for me here. Uh, it, it, so far, to the end of this week, it looks like it's better. I guess it depends how this three-stop load goes. I'm trying to figure out... I'm trying to figure out right now why the camera... Well, it might be because I'm moving. If I don't move, I'll be all right. I, the problem is I'm watching this on a, on a, like a 27-inch TV, and I see how how annoying it's getting. And maybe if I just don't move, I'll be all right. <laughs> all right. So what, what I'm trying to do is, uh, I, like I said, uh, the, 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 the three stop I got is as long as it goes all right, I should be good. Um, you know, I started the week early, so I started Friday. And I'm just trying to push through it as much as I can right now. Uh, like I have leased on to a dedicated carrier. And freight was really good for a while, and it just it just tanked there for a bit. And hopefully, you know, I'm, I know some of the dispatchers watch this channel, uh, and so well, I don't know if he does watch it, but I I know the recruiters watch it a few dozen times, and maybe even the owner uh, has jumped in or at least seen a few of the videos. So I don't know, maybe they see the bull crap I'm going through, and maybe they're going to try to uh, push push it, uh, push some things, uh, through, maybe get, uh, get me wrong more. I don't know. That's just me. I'll think it off the top of my head. Maybe, uh, what'll happen. But even then, I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily say it's, it's the problem here with Tyson or the problem with carry on least on too. I think it's more of just the economy thing. A lot of like, he, there's a lot of mega carries you can pull them back from with things that you're doing. Uh, a lot of contracts changing. And hopefully by 2024 things will change a little bit because I know when con most of the contracts are usually yearly contracts and when they're up I'm sure a lot of these mega carriers which are the ones that pretty much set the rates to be honest with you and then it just you know flows down from there uh, hopefully they're going to uh, negotiate higher rates just because of inflation now there might be other things that they may lose out on depending on negotiating with these shippers and stuff. But, uh, you know, hopefully it trickles down to the rest of us. Uh, in the meantime, I don't think it's going to get any better. So, um, Sterling, I would pull my curtains, but this truck does not have window curtains. It only has sleeper curtains. So, uh, prior to this, I was really actually going to buy a set of, I guess, window blockers. I don't know what they're called, but it was like a $250 set. And right now that's kind of went way on the back burner. You know what I mean? Uh, I have other things to worry about. So, um, yeah, probably you're right. It is changing. But you know what I might actually do? I might actually change this whole operation because I know if I was watching this, I'd be rather annoyed right now. Um, so, we're going to change this whole operation around.
All right. I guess uh, we'll see how uh, if that's any better. Well, it doesn't look like it's jumping back and forth now, so let me see if I can. All right. Now that uh, that I'm not being annoyed um, by that in 20 minutes or so. Um, yeah, so like I was saying, that Being an owner-operator, like I said, especially if you have a family, you have, you have a lot of responsibilities and, and things to go on. And nobody really talks about, they don't talk about the stress, the anxiety that you get when you're doing this. I mean, I'm not, you know, my house is paid for. I'm not worried about, like, stuff like that. Uh, I don't have a truck. I only have a car payment, the old lady's car payment. But between between my... Okay, I don't know what the heck's going on there. But uh, between my truck payments, both of them, I'm paying like like $6,500 a month. And when you're, you know, getting settlements for like 100 bucks, which I, that's what I've got the last two settlements I've had were um, $100. You know, it starts, you know, it, a month can make or break you, just about. And, you know, there's only so many times you can you know this the savings that you have for any day um you can pull out of that and also you know your taxes you have to put away for taxes too so yeah yeah i know that's a lot um like i said i could just be like every other you know dude and just let the uh let the loan expire or, or default on the loan for the uh the 9400 but one, one I don't I don't I, I'm tired of doing that like I, I had a divorce before I I went through all that bull crap before um, you know I just don't I just don't want to be a dirtbag anymore you know just, I mean everybody does it but it's just I'm just tired of having the phone calls uh, being harassed having my credit messed up again uh, it, it just the last year or so, it's finally coming up, and uh, you know, I just don't want to. I just don't want to grenade it again. Uh, and plus, on top of that, you know, it's an actual business loan. It's on in my business name, and it's pretty much the first real business loan I had. You know, I I have some fuel cards and things like that, but you know, if I want to continue doing what I'm doing and you know, turn this into a, what I'd like to do is get my authority again and actually turn this into a business again. Uh, do I really see a future? I don't know at this point. Uh, there's a ton of trucks. There's all this legislation and stuff. You, things are so messed up anymore. You can't like planning out a small business, uh, you know, especially depending on some states you live in, anything could happen any day. Um, Much better on only listening. Okay. I, I don't know what you mean by that, Carolyn, but I guess uh, maybe, yeah, maybe the uh, focus is bothering you too, which I can see, still see it auto focusing. I don't know. Uh, there has to be a way to turn that off. I don't know if it's something to do with inside the app uh, over to the uh, StreamYard app or on my camera app. I'm pretty sure I have auto focus turned off in the camera, so I don't know why why StreamYard would uh, care about that. Um, where was I at? You know, oh yeah, I'm going broke. Uh, no, um, so you know the um, the loan and everything is through my business, it's through my LLC, through my EIN, and I just don't want to um, I don't want to mess that up. I want to be able to, if I want to purchase two or three trucks in the future, uh, grow, uh, get my authority, like I said, again, I want to be able to do that. And I would imagine defaulting on a business loan, especially technically your first large 
business loan is not is not the way to do that. You know what I mean? So, but like guys say, they uh, you know they it, it, there's only so much you can endure till you got to know when to when to fold. And I I mean I'm not to that point yet, and I, I'm hoping I don't get to that point. But this week, it, you know, this week is pretty much going to be a telling sign of that. This and the next week, because uh, there's not many, there's not many more weeks I can endure of a uh, hundred dollar settlement. You know, where's Kyle's yard break piece? Oh, you're talking about Nevada. Oh, I, I don't know. Um, I think he finally got just tired of it and deleted his channel. But, you know, it, I guess it is what it is. Um, but, but, you know, after going off topic there, the, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's great. It's fun. It's great. Uh, you feel like you're accomplishing something to be an owner operator. And other times you just feel like you're, you're a bug on the windshield and, uh, and, you know, no matter what you do, it's, it's never enough. And, you know, that's, that's kind of can happen for any business. I, I did own like an automotive shop home, you know, just about at least trying to open it. I guess you could per se, uh, wasted a lot of money and time and effort in that, um, had a partner that kind of pulled out last minute and there's only so much I could have done by my own. And, uh, you know, it, it, stuff like this, it, there's just some business is business and it's going to, it, it don't care if you, you know, have kids. It doesn't care if you, um, you know, got a mortgage, a car payment. It, it's just, just going to happen continuously. And, you know, I'm to the point to where it almost doesn't phase me. Uh, hence why I can even come on here and just talk about, you know, how shit's going downhill. And, you know, I really don't care what people think. Uh, you know, it'd be different, I guess, if I had side by side the brand new pickup trucks like that but you know how i sold my pickup <laughs> you know what i mean um and it's just uh it's just continuous bad luck and that can happen to anybody uh and people don't really put that out there on youtube that there's so many variables in trucking that you have to rely on and count on it's, it's not just whether or not you're gonna you know go out put the miles down and uh you know do your thing there's you know, especially if you're a company guy, you're, you got to rely on a dispatcher. You got to rely on the mechanic to look at the truck. You got there's so many other variables that you're not really in control of that can still, you know, bite you in the ass. Um, and and look, you know, I I I got a new truck, and a lot of people are saying, you know, oh, we got a new truck. Of course, it's breaking down. Uh, and this and this and that. Well, the old uh, 9400. So let's say. Let's say somehow, magically, uh, you know, the truck didn't continuously break down. And I, I put, over almost two years, I put like $40,000 in that $25,000 or $26,000 truck. And I wasn't even done paying for it. So there's there's all my quick profit that I made from, um, when did I start? I jumped in in April, April of 2021. And what, by August of 2022, rates like took a shit? No, not August. Uh, no, I jumped in April of 2020. No, August of 2021. And by April 2022, uh, rates took a shit, you know, uh, at least on the Reaper side. And I jumped back over to, I jumped back to the flatbed, which originally that's what I wanted to do anyway, but I bummed my knee out. And, you know, eventually by the middle, middle of the summer, by 2022, rates for flatbed were really shitty too, and and everyone else jumped on the flatbed too. So you had all that extra capacity and everything. And you know, I was I was just making it. And like I said, I continuously still had things go wrong with the old truck until I came here. When I came here, I had almost a full solid month of like shit uh, settlements that were like these are net settlements. Net settlements were like seven thousand dollars. So between all the 
the makeup bills and things that I was getting behind and, and uh, things that I was letting, you know, go, not, you know, that needed repaired at the house or even on the truck. I took that money and I put it into that truck those first couple of weeks that I got those huge settlements. And then the engine blew up. And, uh, you know, if it would have lasted like another month, I probably could have swung a rebuild. I could at least probably put 50% down on a warrant, you know, on a, on a loan that would have uh, paid for a full rebuild. So I was getting quotes for like $40,000. Uh, and these were like Joe Schmo uh, rebuild shops, you know, no name little shops. This wasn't like uh, common deal or anything or, or stuff like that. Um, Cummins dealer said uh, like $58,000, $60,000 for an old 371 to have it actual full wind frame done. So I don't know. Like I said, that was just a pandemic cool crap. Maybe the prices have gone down. Maybe it was because there were parts available and you were paying markup. But it was it was just you know astronomical to put that much money into a truck that old. And like I said, I knew I, I checked the Kingston's myself. But the truck's been, the truck's old. It had like, I don't know. I think it had, I think it had 1.6 million on it. But er, you know, the uh, the title and everything said six and six and a half thousand. But um, it just uh, it just wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth it to invest that money into the truck. And all, all I saw was another, you know, couple breakdowns or or another couple twenty thousand dollars worth of repairs. So that's why I ended up doing what I did here. I uh, figured a brand new truck, what, what the hell's going to have, ha- you know, have happen. Um, I said, worse, I might get my first tech engine light or, or stop engine light at what, a hundred thousand miles, you know, at the, at the, the least, but you know, 40,000 miles, right? I'm like breaking down nonstop, but it looks like, uh, so far it seems like it's fixed. It probably was just the injector issue. I still haven't got the work order back. It's still getting, trying to get approved is being approved by the warranty so i don't know whenever they decide to send me the final work order i'll see if they change the def pump which i thought they did because the one guy mentioned it but maybe they didn't i think maybe they just did the six injectors i don't know how that has anything to do with def fluid maybe it's just how how the um the nos sense nos sensor relays the information to the uh, pcm and computer, you know, thinks it's uh, bad DEF quality when it really was actual, uh, you know, a bad uh, uh, combustion issue or whatnot. Um, let's try to, oh, I wish I could do it right there, but uh, let's try to read some comments. Let's see if it's um, let's see, we got Dirty Diesel on here. Uh, what state do you live in? Uh, have you considered local owner op if OTR rates rock? Um, well, technically, I, I don't really do owner. I, don't, I mean, I don't really do OTR right now. I do mostly regional and, and practically uh, local sometimes. But, you know, in, in the Northeast, local, local can pay pretty well doing local and regional stuff. And, um, uh, you know, like I said, I don't want to, like, give any information that, that that's the way, like, if you're just maybe asking for yourself or anything. But right now, the, with the way things are, it's a crapshoot kind of lovely. So, uh, you know, anybody that gives information out, they can only give the best information out they can from previous years that they've been in the industry. And so far, since, what, you know, since the pandemic started and everything like that, it, this, it, the, the entire industry is upside down. It's it, rapidly changes faster than it ever really did it's um it's chaotic uh there's so much other things influencing it too now you got all, all the all the scams and double brokering and things so for me to honestly come out and say what you should and shouldn't do it's you know i don't want to be the one to be blamed for anything uh per se all i can do is give an example on how you know how it's going for me and what I would do, but it's just, um, like I said, I have a new truck and I'm having problems with it. So, uh, you know, somebody that goes out and buys a uh, Pro Star off of Lone Mountain, you know, imagine, imagine what can happen there with that. So, 
it's just uh, you know it's 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 hard to I would love to be able to give like perfect advice to somebody on here, but it's it's just so hard to do that now because nothing nothing lasts like the the way the the industry you know is shifting all the time. There's no way to anticipate or or plan ahead. I guess you could say. Uh, unless you're big enough, you're like a mega carry, you know, they just, they just make their own destiny if you want to call it that. Um, but like, like even for instance, like I talked about in my, uh, the little, uh, video I just did, uh, trucking news and, uh, insight, you know, if, if UPS goes on strike or YRC disappears, uh, you know, depending on who may buy them, which I, I have a feeling that's what that's what will probably happen there with that, but you know that can change the market too. In an instance, it could be be for the bad or for the, for the good. You know things like that, things that you don't plan for. Um, it, you know, and it, it, it they can happen like that if you're not set up to be able to, like like right now, like me, I'm not set up to take take a loss all the time. I don't have I don't don't have a big savings account for my business anymore. That's long gone with the old truck and, and things that were happening there with that and technically getting screwed over by some repair shop and just certain things that I couldn't do on my own with my own bare hands. So it's just, uh, man, I'm thinking about it. It sounds like an endless death spiral here, but uh, eventually I'll try to get to the uh, funny side of, of everything, but I just want people to know that this isn't a get rich quick scheme, uh, trucking, you know, becoming an owner operator. And a lot, of, a lot of people do view it as that. I mean, I guess if you, if you came from making six, 700 bucks a week to maybe making 1200 to $1,500 a week, you know, yeah, you probably think trucking's the biggest, best thing. But then, like I said, everybody ends up spending more. I've been really good on trying not to spend more at home. Um, well, in fact, I really don't really do anything. Like I said, I'm a private size on the truck. Um, I, hell, I've almost been thinking about selling some of my arsenal. Uh, <laughs> that's a little hard to do because I know, I don't think, you know, gun prices are probably where they should be. But it's just, uh, you know, it's, 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 it is what it is. So I don't know. Like I said, I'm sounding like a broken record here. Um, Let's see, T21, what's up? Let's see, uh, Dirty Diesel, not meaning to beat you up, uh, but buying a new truck doesn't always guarantee. No, no, I know. I said that a little bit earlier. I guess it was there. Um, you would just think that you would have less problems. I mean, there's some people that can go out and, you know, just whatever they cut turns to gold, I guess you could say, per se. They just. Either, either they have things worked out very well uh, or a, a savings, you know, a, a savings to fall upon that, uh, that they could pretty much devote entirely to the business. Or they, uh, they just get lucky and they just buy some, a truck that's been well taken care of that, you know, it, it wasn't a Monday truck per se or whatever you want to call it. And, and that's just what happens. You know, there's some people that can come out here, they can buy a $10,000 truck, put $2,000 into it and run it for two years without without ever having a, a problem at all. Then there's other people that can buy a brand new truck and, you know, in like 20 or 30,000 miles, it breaks down like three times and maybe spend six months in a dealership, which luckily so far hasn't been me, but it, you know, my new truck has broken down. Uh, so it's, you know, like I said, it's a crap shoot for everyone. Everyone has their own, I guess, their own struggle, I guess, per se. It just it depends how, how long the struggle's drawn out. Uh, Jacka Nova. Uh, it's no right answer in trucking. Uh, it's a, uh, yeah, a dice roll regardless of how hard you work and how much you save. Yes, to a point. Um, I'm not going to go out 100% safe like always like that, but, you know, there are some guys that do questionable things that bring it up on themselves. And you know what? Technically, uh, Maybe it would have been a better idea if I just became a truck, uh, I mean, a company driver there for a while. But I was already, see, the problem is that was easy for me to do 
prior to 2000. Uh, like I said, 2000, I got a taste for the real money coming in, if you could say that. Uh, I had two employees that were happy uh, working for me. Uh, I had a dedicated account, and and things were just things were just going good. Uh, and that lasted maybe six months, um, maybe a little bit longer. Then you know the election came up. Then you know the uh, presidential uh, you know, uh, powers changed hands. And I'm not saying it's that, but I'm saying it might have might have contributed to you know the to the industry that I was servicing, and it might have contributed to that because that industry is really the EPA is kind of not the EPA, well, I guess the EPA is on them or something. But anyway, it was utility coal. So that industry, you know, they cut down trees, they they use a lot of bad chemicals. So that might have contributed to that industry a little bit. Uh, wanting to change or, or find cheaper, like dirt cheap uh, people to run their run their uh, their poles or whatnot. But uh, anyway, I digress. But once you get into that and you you feel like you accomplished something, it's kind of hard to go back from there. I guess I I should say it's hard to go, like especially from being an owner operator and maybe even a lease purchase driver. Let's say if you were making the money or not, um, it's hard to go. It's hard to jump back. Uh, from that, and then have to go to not not necessarily like me answering to somebody else. That's not the problem. It's just that the pay rate, the pay rate, the probably one of the other things. Like I said before um, on the video that I did um, at R Rickard Flint, uh, doing that hike thing. It when when you're just normally like trucking's already bad for family, you know, time and everything. But when you when you end up working for somebody that's like, you know, you tell them a, two weeks ahead of time, like, hey, you know, uh, I'd like to take off, like take vacation or my kids' baseball game is like I don't know Thursday or Friday night, you know, can I have off? And they tell you, uh, no, you know, that's uh, and it's not that it just wants it repetitively or they demand that you do overtime or this or that or or you're out on the road. And they demand you do this extra load or whatnot. That you know that gets to you after a while. Uh, you know, a few times, you know, hey, you take one for the team, but continuously having that with you know even different employers, continuously having that, it, it starts getting to you. So I just didn't, I didn't want to have to go back to that. Um, you know, right now, you know, financially, I can't really take off right now. In fact, the whole family is down at at a family beach house right now that, that the whole family shares, and uh, they're enjoying themselves in Ocean City. Where am I? Sitting at some dirty truck stop here uh, down in Virginia, whether in Ocean City, uh, New Jersey. You know, you, you just got to do what you got to do, like I said. It, it, but it's different when you're working for somebody and they tell you, hey, you know, uh, go kick uh, go kick dirt rocks or whatever. Uh, especially after you've already continuously done favors for them. So, I don't know. I guess that's just, I guess that's just how I feel about that. You know, going. I, I guess I feel like it's backwards, almost a backwards thing. But you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. I don't. I don't fault anybody for going back to being a company driver or anything like that. It's just how I feel inside. You know, eventually, if it gets bad enough, you gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, but it's uh, it's probably more of a pride thing than anything. Just like this. Like I don't even know if I really like. I'm putting it all out there. You know, it's a pride thing. Uh, you know, men men have pride. It's just you know, especially when you're supporting your family and stuff. And and you know, I'm sure there's guys that are in trucks right now, or, or have been, or are that are staring at the freaking side, staring at their phone, going through Indeed. You know, just the things going through their head. Like my wife pissed off at me. It's like the the one post I put. You know, hey, hon, you know, you said uh, you know buying a truck and and you were going to make money, and it's eight months later, or six months later, and where's the money at? Uh, you know, or you spent more money than you paid and whatnot. And, uh, you know, that happens a lot in trucking. And nobody really talks about it. Everybody, like I'll say, even when I was younger, when I first got my CDL and stuff, and I seen YouTube videos about being an owner-operator and stuff, the first thing I thought is, yeah, this, you can jump right into, you know, your own business with very little overhead. Well, it, it's not, not, I wouldn't say very little overhead, but you can get a loan. Like when I went to go start an automotive shop, it was very hard to get a loan for a brick and mortar kind of, you know, compared to just getting a, a loan for a truck, I guess you could say. 
But hell, you can go to Lone Mountain and get one as long as you got five thousand dollars in the bank account. Um, so, you know that that appealed to me real quick, and you know, I was going to go out and do it right away when I had my CD. I was going to maybe first year I was going to go out and try to come on an offer, and then I thought about it for a bit, and you know talked to a few people and saw that yeah, it's not all cracked up to you. It just so happens the the couple of years that I was going to get into it were really bad years for being an owner operator. So I just stayed out of it and stayed a company driver. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I'm, I know I'm a little over all over the place, but like I said, this is kind of, uh, you know, it's, like I said, taking a little bit hit to the pride a little bit here, but you know, I, I just wanted to make sure guys, like I said, guys know that, like I said, they uh, like I said, three times now. Uh, there are guys that are staring at the phone on Indeed or staring at the side, you know, staring out the window and they just don't, they don't know what to do. Uh, they're stressed out and, you know, they got a family relying on them. They got mortgage payments, bills and stuff. And, uh, you know, they got, they might have shafted themselves. That, you know, I'm not going to say this. there are people, you know, it is business. Some, some shit is your fault. Like I said, I'm, I'm not necessarily trying to cry a river here. I'm just trying to, uh, Put, put the real put the real shit out there. That this is what can happen to you. Uh, no matter how how much money you have sitting away, no matter how much you think you know the market, um, you know, especially like the guys that do the point clicks and the, uh, the, the uh, Uber freight and JB Hunt 360 and stuff. Like, you know, I I've, I've watched some videos and stuff, and they just go go about it like you know just everyday normal thing, and and um. I just look at it like you become a you're you're trying to run a business and you basically became a gig worker. You know, sure you're making you're making fifteen hundred dollars net, maybe real net or whatnot at the end of the week, and you think you're making tons of money because you were making five hundred dollars a week or not. But when shit really hits the fan, when that truck really starts breaking down, or you have continuous problems, or or maybe the broker don't want to pay you, or something happens to JP Hunt three sixty, you're screwed. You're screwed. Then you start blaming everybody else but yourself, um, you know, because you didn't, you don't really know what you're got involved in. You don't know how to actually just call up real brokers and talk to them. You're still doing point and clicks and things. And, um, you know, it, it can go both ways, you know. Uh, and like I said, what I'm thinking about here, I guess you want to call the word humility, I guess. And that's, that's not exactly what, um, uh, what I'm trying to look for right now, I'm trying to, like I said, make this more of an educational thing, just to, just to put it all out there and uh, say this, you know, it can happen. Um, let's see, dirty diesel. I know tanker has been slowing down for chemicals in uh, some parts of the country, but fuel is still pumping. Well, that's because they're still owner operators. Uh, you know, running for pennies on the dollar, I guess you could say. Uh, but yeah, with chemicals, though, if you, it's another sign that the economy is going down. Just like, just like how here at Tyson, uh, you know, they're they're like the largest meat producer in the U.S. There's nobody really, you know, there's nobody really to put them under per se. You know, you have to do. Um, I don't, know, I don't know how much Tyson wants. Um, no, not Tyson wants. What's that other one? There's a Chinese owned one. But you know, they're they're pretty much the three big players, and they own all these smaller companies that you know the names of, but you don't think they're associated with Tyson. The same thing with Purdue and the other one. Um, so it's it's almost like a a monopoly, practically. So there is no real competition. So in general, the only the only conclusion you can come to is that it's People, people probably can't buy as much meat as they can uh, could do before. Um, I also know that a lot of the stimulus stuff for like, uh, oh, what was it for like uh, food stamps? A lot of that extra money all disappeared. You know, they probably were just buying steak and so you know put it on food stamps. So that that might be a contributing factor to that too. The sales just dropped. Um, so right now, I think you know it's probably going to be hard for everybody because I'm thinking the economy is slowing down. And right there, you know, that that, can, that proves it too. Uh, and eventually, I guess, you know, fuel might come slow down. Um, 
I mean, I haven't looked at any of the AAA reports about vacation or something around uh, Fourth of July or, or anything like that. But you know, that that plays a plays a factor into it too. Uh, dirty diesel. I agree. Some new trucks uh, can go four hundred thousand miles without any issues. Others are in a shop. I had a. I worked for a company, and I drove a. 2016 Cascadia. I think I got it when it had, I'd want to say 45 or 50,000 miles on it. And I drove that truck up to, yeah, about 400,000 miles. And that truck, I never had to put a lift fluid in it. Uh, I never had to, I never had to do anything to it. it. It just ran. Never, never had a problem with the batteries that whole time. Um, didn't have any. And you know what? It didn't have an APU on it either. It did not have an APU on it either. And I ran that truck up to just about, I think it was like 387,000 miles or something when I got out of it. And uh, nothing, nothing happened. So that whole time that truck was profitable without without ever having a problem. It had normal maintenance under it. Um, it went to, it went back to, I think they had pension doing it. But I mean, uh, there were never lights on. Nothing ever got worked. I think it might have had a. I think one time it had a crack, cracked cooling bottle. And I think that was it, and it didn't really put me out. You know, it didn't. I didn't. It didn't bother me at all. I just went and took it to the fence, and they put a new cooling bottle. In. Other than that, that's that's it. That's the only thing that happened in that truck, ever. Uh, so, like I said, it's it's not that it. it it's a, it's more of a luck thing. It's just shit happens. Um, they're not. They're not on a percentage wise reliable as the old trucks were because you got so much extra shit on them. Um, the old trucks, you know, it had three or four problems, and that's really all that could go wrong. Now, sometimes people have bad luck, and it could just continuously go wrong, leaving all old trucks. Or now, if you buy an older truck, if you buy an older truck now, unless you're paying like a hundred thousand dollars for an older truck or sixty thousand or something like that, the truck's been meticulously taken care of by like a a bull hauler or something. You know, Something where they, you know, they shine the truck up, they check everything, they work on their own equipment, you know, and they're not trying to, like, jip you. You might get an older truck, you got uh, bushing, kingpin, uh, brake chambers, uh, the uh, the power divider. It, it, you know, unless it's making noise and stuff, you ain't going to know if there's something really wrong in it and it's, it's going to break. Um, you know, that's, that happened to me, like, the first two months I had the truck, or three months I had the truck uh, when I had that... Uh, the 9400 uh just you know you're still buying you could easily be buying somebody else's problem you know with a new truck you think hey it's a new truck you get at least like 100,000 miles without a check engine especially the newer ones because they have gotten a lot better with this emission compared to i know when they like first came out with it in the 13 stuff like that 2012 um but you know a lot of people that have those trucks, those 2013 and 2012, you know what they did? They deleted them because they're super easy to delete. Uh, newer trucks, especially this one, you're uh, you're gonna have a hell of a time deleting. Um, you know, the EPA's enacted a bunch of bullshit, uh, double check systems, things like that, to, to basically make you not able to delete these. So, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much you know I would say the situation between. Or new and old, it's, it's a crap shoot. Like I said, unless you don't buy somebody else's problems and you have the money to to ward off some of that, it can happen. And everyone says also buy fleet vehicles. Fleet vehicles are always well maintained and stuff. Some of these fleet, I don't know. I guess someone hit a bump. I thought they hit the back of the trailer. Um, some of these fleets, they don't. For instance, this is like a 2013 or 14 Cascade. If you could hear this damn thing, it, it it's not like your normal DD15. Uh, they definitely have that damn thing wide open and deleted. But but anywho, um, you know some of these fleets they don't change their oil for 50, 60 thousand miles. Does that detrimental on the engine? Probably. I sure as hell won't want a truck you know that, that had oil changes like that, but. They, they do it. As long as the warranty covers it still, they'll continuously do it. So you don't ever know what you're getting. Uh, and, and you might buy that truck anyway and run it to 2 million miles. It might be fine. Another guy might buy a truck. Um, for instance, like I said, I, I bought a um, 
ISX Cascadia. Uh, I think I bought it 260,000 miles or 270,000 miles or something. I ran it to like 290, and the ceramic plungers came apart inside the fuel pump, wiped the motor out. Uh, aftermarket warranty said it was an accessory part. The fuel pump was a part of the technically was covered on the engine. They're not going to cover it. Uh, what was left of the Cummins warranty said they weren't going to cover it. So I was stuck between a ha- rock and a hard place. It was sitting at a uh, Freightliner dealership that's been done in PA, and they wanted uh, like sixty-eight thousand dollars for a whole new engine because they didn't want it. They didn't want to rebuild it because they said the entire engine's full of metal shavings. They said no matter how many times we flushed out, there's going to be shit in the oil uh, or the fuel system. So they said the fuel system needs to be replaced. This needs to be replaced. You know, by the time you're done, they just want to put a whole new freight motor in. So, like I said, that it can happen that easy. And I got very lucky with that. I lost thirty grand, but uh, you know, it didn't ruin my credit. I didn't have people coming after me. Uh, you know, they probably took it, put a used engine in it, and resold it again. Kept my thirty grand, and uh, you know, refinanced it somebody else. Oh, uh, I know. I'm like not reading comments here. I'm just blabbering and blabbering. Um, let's see, Freedom Work. How many truck drivers will never get on? How many truck drivers will never get out of the uh, trap of making payments to the employees, uh, employers? Uh, I see no. Uh, I see so many. Contact. Oh, oh. There we go. I see so many drivers that are 20 years in trucking and doing lease purchases. Yep. Uh, for the fifth time, and you know what? Too, it's it's. Like if you're gonna do a lease, if you're gonna do technically like a lease purchase or a purchase like that, um, you might as well just go go to loan out. Go to loan out. Like I, I guess that the big thing is that you you need some kind of money down. Um, and it, I guess if you know if you're an employee, I mean I guess everybody's home home uh, situation is different. So you can't like save up like a five thousand dollars to put down on a loan out truck, which I like I said I'm not saying it's the right way or whatever. Still crap shoot. Uh, either way, but if you can't save that at least that little bit of money on it, what what means you know what makes you think that when you are making a couple thousand dollars net possibly that you're gonna do anything different with that money? Um, like I said, it's 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 a personalized mindset, um, and I guess it's harder for me because technically I at least feel that I have that mindset. Um, down kind of pat, and I still continuously, still continuously have problems. So it's uh, it just is what it is, I guess. Uh, Dirty Diesel agrees. Freedom Works. Uh, I'm in a lease purchase, but once my truck is paid for, I plan to keep it and save. Uh, if I ever buy another truck, I'd rather do it cash. And yeah, you you know that's that's probably the right to do way to do it. Um, now, like I said, there are other lease purchases. There are some lease purchases that are total. Most of them are total shit shows, especially in, most of them out of Chicago uh, area. But and then there are there are some that are doable. Uh, in this market, lease purchases is very hard to do. Uh, you know, especially if you're just doing a regular dry van. If you're just in a regular dry van and you're you're doing like a at uh, least purchase on a brand new truck. So unless you're at, that carrier has super dedicated lanes that are set up and, and, and everything, and they're willing to maybe share the rate confirmation with you and everything and don't try to screw you, you know, you're on borrowed time probably. They're just, they're waiting for you to bring that truck back and become a company driver and do it to the next person because they save money. They save money on the truck. They don't have to, they, they, they save, uh, I saw an article somewhere, I just screenshot it a while ago, I think they save anywhere from twenty to thirty-five percent, and depending depending if they're overcharging you for the truck and stuff, uh, it might even be less. You know, on paying you compared to a company driver, or paying you a, a settlement compared to a company driver, and they don't they don't have to worry about the truck per se or anything like that. I've already seen it where there's lease purchases where the trucks have warranty, and you take it in to the dealership, and they cover a lot of stuff under the warranty, and then even though it was warranty work, you don't get the work order because technically it's their, you know, whoever, whoever you're leasing to, technically it's their truck. They end up sending you a bill. The, the company you work for that you're leasing the truck to send you a bill for those repairs, even though they were covered under warranty. So, 
Dak, uh, Dakanova, Dakanova, is that how you say it? Uh, it's it's rough. Uh, the sacrifices we make uh, can't wait to get get out of this. Uh, I kind of think of the same way too. That I can't wait to get out of this, or or to you know pay, finish this truck game and pay it off and everything. And then you always end up thinking about the what if. Like, what if I get back to where I was with two employees and do things differently or maybe diversify more? Um, you know, I paid them well. They had insurance and stuff. Uh, there were no, nobody ever complained or anything. They did their job. And, you know, uh, it was a small extra income coming. It was like having an extra, uh, an extra partner working. Like, like I said, I didn't, you know, depending on certain weeks, I did make more money. But the majority of the time, it was just like an extra. Um, I'm trying to think about what would the average be. It was probably like an average of an extra thousand dollars a week coming in uh, that I wasn't, you know, because I was still driving, I was still doing stuff. So it was an extra thousand dollars a week on top of whatever I was making, uh, running my own load. Uh, uh, sometimes it was more, you know. Sometimes it, it would do some oversized loads or something, or they would, it, it, they would run extra, extra spot market freight, and you know. There, there could be weeks where, you know, I was making like an extra 26, 27, uh, maybe an extra three or four grand on top of what I already was making. So if I was bringing home netting $5,000 and there was another three or $4,000 coming in, uh, you know, uh, in a week there, you just made what, like almost 10 grand. But then next week, you're, the other truck breaks down and then you end up paying, what, I don't know, $6,000 for a new oil cooler or anything like that so i mean it it is what it is you know you think you could be getting ahead and it doesn't take much you know the the percentages of what you're paying out for repairs and things sometimes are a lot higher than the amount that you're making uh, especially because continuously happens you have problems or things slow down that's the problem there's no there's no steady there's not no real steady variable uh now some guys some guys do have that like uh Guys that haul for the co-op and, and things like that. A lot of times they do get steady work. And, I mean, they do have bad times too. But it's, it's, it's a crapshoot. Either way you look at it. Uh, you just got to be able to, once you, once you do get the money coming in, you got to be able to hopefully not have to fill in the hole that you're already, you know, in. Uh, that, that's a little bit my problem. I, I got a lot of holes to still fill. Uh, and, uh, you know, build up an actual savings to, to combat that uh you know to where you could almost just buy another truck if you had to you know there's guys that can do that they can just get get a loan or get credit where they have a real big bad problem with the truck they'll just freaking sit it on pasture sell the damn thing or whatever and just go out and buy another truck like that you know within a week well sometimes you can't do that <laughs> uh freedom works uh yep six months later where is the money yep uh, Dakanova. Uh, I was in. I was on Indeed. Uh, try to find job working on a oil rig. Yeah, like I said, example. It's like hell. I'm. I'm even checking out Indeed. Um, I'm seeing a lot of. See, the problem though is how it seems like a lot of these blue collar jobs are following some of the lines of, uh, you know, trucking or whatnot, and they're giving you variable amounts that they could pay. They could pay $25 an hour, they could pay $70 an hour. They're not really going to tell you. I mean, especially the construction jobs, because some of these involve, you know, if they do, if they do get a bid for a state job, you know, there's a prevailing wage or whatnot. And, you know, I could technically go and, and I've operated my equipment before. I mean, I'm not, it's been a while now. Uh, I've operated like a shitty Volvo uh, skid steer and uh, I've operated, I don't know, a couple dozen, uh, uh, yeah, never mind, not a shitty Volvo skid steer. I mean, I've operated a couple dozen skid steers, operated a shitty Volvo loader, uh, doing mulch and stuff. Uh, I operated a Cinnabogan, moving utility poles around. I've operated a, a crane, uh, a truck mounted crane, uh, moving marble and granite around and stuff. So, I mean, it's not like I couldn't maybe get into that, but I don't, I don't have any you know, per se, I don't have any knowledge about the CPS rating and stuff like that. So, you know, I could maybe go into that and do that, maybe make $30 an hour uh, starting out. But, uh, you know, if you think about all the shit that I've done here with, uh, 
to change the uh, lighting here. So it looks like you know, blue and everything gone downhill. Um, like I said, I could do that, but like with everything I got going on here, if I just walk away from it, I'm, you know, I'm talking about going bankrupt again. Um, and and actually, to be honest, I'm, I've already said this before. I am in a little bit of a hole with taxes. And there's no way I'm going to dig my way out of that hole working a regular, like, nine-to-five job unless I become, like, a lawyer or a nurse or a doctor or something like that. So I, I just, I, I, that's, at least that's my assumption. Maybe in 30 years I'm going to dig my way out of that hole, but I would like to, like, get it out of the way, you know, like, within a you know, few years, not, not 30 uh, that too, like I said, uh, if you get some really bad advice, become an owner operator, you know, like, uh, like, ah, oh, your first year or two, they're probably, they're not going to, there's nobody going to audit you. Nobody's going to fucking know. Nobody, nobody's going to know what you're making in taxes and stuff. Um, oh, oh yeah, they, they will find out. You'll get away with your first two years and right before the six years up or seven years or not, that's when they'll mail you. So that's, uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure they probably knew that first two or those first two years, they probably knew that I wasn't paying taxes. And they're like, well, we'll just wait until about six years or seven years is up for the uh, statute of limitations. And then we'll hit you with all the penalties. So that's that's my stupid fault. I was young. I was dumb. I listened to certain owner operators and certain people that contracted or ran other businesses. And, um, you know, good for them. They got away with it. Me? No, I didn't get away with it. And, you know, like I said, uh, and I had I had my I had my divorce, so that's really the reason why I was like, man, I'm making a lot of money. I really could use it uh, for you know, the legal fees and everything I still owe, and some stuff I put on credit. And uh, you know, it didn't turn out that way. Uh, you know, I, I'm not blaming nobody but myself for that. But so, uh, let's see here. Uh, Zakanova. Uh. The ants drive the rate. Yeah, the ants drive the rates down. Uh, point and click. Yeah, forty-five k, one dollar a mile. Yeah, forty-five thousand pounds loads, uh, one dollar a mile, uh, and go lease pipe running the industry. Uh, not ruining the industry. Yeah, that's um, that's that's well, that's exactly like I said. The the big thing that happened to trucking, I would say, in the last couple of years is. Guys that are becoming owner operators are becoming lease purchase drivers. They're they're treating this more like they are driving a Lyft or an Uber or something. They're just they just think that they just do the you just go on here and you take your mouth or you go on your phone and you just oh I just made nine I just made nine hundred dollars just like that. They don't they don't know anything about fuel. They don't know anything about you know breakdowns. So they just away. They just think they just know that they're making more than they were at their six hundred dollar a week job. Uh, and it's it's a delusional, it's delusion. You know, it's it's uh, it's smoke and mirrors. You know, you think you're making money. Um, you know, your way of life might. You know, maybe maybe you're able to buy. I don't know a side by side now or a new truck. You're able to afford a new truck payment, but it, it's still it's you don't really own that truck. It's still a delusion. Anything to happen, you're you're done. Um, anything to happen with the truck, anything to happen with race. Uh, you know, especially if you're not like getting the rate confirmation from the people you're leased on to or, or doing the lease purchase with and stuff like that, it, it could just, it's, it's just a downward, uh, spiral from there, I guess. Uh, Pablo, uh, I drive a 99, yeah, a 99 classic. I'm driving it for three years. And the only problem I had is the AC. Exactly. Um, uh, you know, I, I figured I would at least get a year or two out of this thing without, you know, maybe only having like the AC or tire or something like that. It, just some people, some people, that's how it goes. And I'm sure, I'm sure you've been able to make lots of money with that truck. And other people, uh, hell, I think, uh, what was it? Um, well, one, I came out of the dealership out of bad alignment. All right. Sat there for like three days. Still ain't fixed. It still needs to go down to the alignment. Uh, I can't, you know, I'm planning on, if I do end up going to empty alignment, I'm sure they're going to work on it for a while. Who knows if it's, the rear axles aren't uh, aligned right or whatnot. Um, they're probably, I'll probably have them do uh, 
uh, tire rotation and balancing. I'm planning on spending a thousand dollars there. Uh, there's been already a few times where I was thinking about taking a thousand dollars. I still have a maintenance account. I'm still putting like um, about two fifty, three hundred dollars away. Well, when I got it, <laughs> I'm still putting it away as a maintenance account because I know tires are going to be. You know, I'm going to put real tires on this thing when eventually they go and brakes and stuff, and it's going to be. It's going to cost some money. So it's just, uh, you know, I can't touch that money. I mean, if something did go wrong, like I got a flat tire or something like that, I mean, that, that's no problem. But to a point, it, you know, you got to start looking at whether I keep the money in there or in my taxes or in my maintenance account, or do I start pulling it out little by little and funneling it over to the house? You know, luckily, whatever the wifey makes almost covers everything at the house. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, things start going wrong in the house or, or you need, you need something uh, to make your life easier at the house. Um, you know, whatever that may be, that's, that's when you start, you know, start stressing out. Uh, like I said, I'm not, I'm stressed out and I don't have a mortgage, house paid for and everything, but still there, there's still car payments, there's still water bills, there, there's things that are piling up from before when, uh, uh I still have, um, Two bills that I'm back on when the truck the 4900 uh, or 9400. Um, let's see, I didn't work for like almost a whole month or two. Uh, you know, I'm still back behind some bills that I had to call and try to put off, push off payments uh, and just been slowly paying back. And now this happens, so it, it, it just you you can call it whatever you want to call it. You can call it bad luck. You can call it bad planning. You can call it uh, you know you did it to yourself, but it, it can it. It happens. It happens to guys all the time out here. Forty-four Magnum uh, restoration of an older old truck is always uh, to go in my opinion. And you know, I that's fine. But a lot of guys they, they need a lot of money right off the bat. Uh, when I first technically jumped into actual owner operator, like owning a truck. The first truck I bought was a great deal. At least I thought it was. It was a 1989 uh, Peterbilt 377. And it was a barn fine kind of technically. It was painted. Something like, like apparently the guy, and the, uh, the guy and his kid did a lot of work on it. But it sat. It sat after they did the work. The kid never picked it up, never ended up driving or whatever. And it sat for I don't know how many years. But it had brand new Michelin tires on it. There were huge cracks. In the in the uh, in the steer, they, they, like these were brand new tires. They still had like the little the divots things on them practically, but they were just sitting. It was the truck was sitting, so the the tires dry rotted. The back tires I could probably got away with the drives. I guess the sun wasn't correctly beating on them all the time, but you know they were. You could tell they were getting a little cracked, but they weren't split open like the front square. Uh, all the all the hoses were pretty much taking a shit. Um, the engine, the engine, I'm almost 90% sure it was either rebuilt by somebody or they rebuilt it there in like their, their barn or whatever. Uh, the, the pump was rebuilt. Uh, it was all gummed up, but it was, you could tell it was rebuilt. And the thing was, the thing was a runner, but it had, you know, the interior mice got into it. Shit. Um, none of the, none of the HVAC crap work. Uh, all that stuff was leaking. It, it just, it was a, it was a nightmare. I should have, I should have knew better before I dropped like, I think like fourteen thousand on it, and about another I don't know, a couple thousand dollars apart because I was just going to keep going. I was like, I'm already in it to keep going, and I turned around and sold it, and I barely sold it for. Actually, I lost. I think I lost like a thousand or two thousand dollars selling that stuff. But that that's what I initially thought I was going to do. I was going to buy something that was, you know, bulletproof. It was a thirty four oh six eight. You know, it was bulletproof, and um, it just I just got over and over my head uh, with it. It just it was. I would, I would have had to probably to technically make that DOT legal, like, you know, not have to worry and jump around scales and stuff. I probably would have had to put another, let's see, the most big thing too is I couldn't do everything. Um, I probably would have had to put another 15 grand in that truck to make it super legal and, and to pay people to do some of the work. Maybe more. Might have even been more, but it, and, and even then, it wouldn't have been like 100% right. I wouldn't, you know, I would still have the shitty seats in it. Uh, it would have been hurting my ass, and stuff like that. Like, it would not have been perfect by no means. I could have probably maybe made money with it for a certain amount of time before I got fed up with it, um, or at least fed up with not having, you know, hopefully I'd be making money to, to 
keep continuously fix it or do something with it or, or, or you know, restorate it or whatnot. But, um, yeah, that was my little, I guess, what do you want to call it? My little hurrah with, with trying to restore a truck, per se. And I, I got it pretty cheap. You know, technically it was a 370, uh, it's basically a short, it's a short nose, a 377 uh, Peterbilt is like a short nose 379 with a ugly looking plastic hood put on the front of it. But, um, you know, that was my little hurrah with a technically a, a not plastic truck, per se, uh, besides the 9400, technically, I guess, it's still a plastic truck. Um, dirty diesel again. I would not touch a fleet vehicle. One of my buddies works for Pepsi. They only change the oil once a year, yep, in their trucks, and they do not use a bypass system. Yep. Uh, and maybe they'll, what they'll do is a lot of them will just continuously throw filters on it. Like every couple months, they'll put like four filters on it in a year and uh, just run the oil. That's their, their way to save money. Because really, to be honest, when most of these trucks, especially the warranty ones, I know a lot of people are like, oh, please take care of them. And, and some of them do. Some of them do. A lot of, a lot, probably like Prime and them. The reason they end up getting taken care of, actually, is because they're probably least purchase drivers, and they're the ones kind of putting the bill a little bit. So they have to do the stuff to at least keep the truck moving for the you know, least purchase guy and stuff like that. But the majority of these trucks, like especially when you um, you know, work with some of these mega carriers, like let's say Western Express, we you know they're, they're due tags. They probably run the damn trucks in the ground Everything gets covered in a warranty, and as soon as they can get, you know, offloaded either to auction or auction it to dealerships, and then dealerships pick it up. You don't think the dealership's going to put, like, 15 grand into these trucks. They're going to do as little as possible and then stick it out in a lot. Um, I know, like, for instance, a lot of the Lone Mountain trucks, they're, um, like, the smaller smaller sleeper, the 52-inch sleepers and stuff that they have, they're all ex-JB uh, Hunt trucks. Well, you really, do you think J.B. Hunt was fixing them all the time? You know, maybe they were doing the minimal maintenance to keep the warranty up on them. Um, but you, you, had got, you had company drivers in there that were just doing local and regional runs, just beating the shit out of them, really. They, they wanted to get home. They wanted to do this. Um, it was always somebody else's problem, I guess, to check things. So, you know, it, it is what it is. Uh, now, the, the, now, like I said, there are some fleets that, that particularly just take care of the truck. And if you can, like, go to those, like, TMC. TMC, I would buy a truck from TMC, put it that way. Um, you know, I've heard bad things, too, about that, but they, they meticulously take care of the truck. Uh, maybe there's here certain uh, different terminals here and there that just don't give a crap or not, but for the most part, TMC takes care of their truck. Hey, what's up, Roland Ryan? Uh, all right, here we go. Uh, fleet work. Uh, mad respect uh, to you, uh, driver, for pull, for putting out there and telling it like how it is. Keep up the great work uh, that you are. I got to put a free, I got to put some eye drops in. I don't want to go crazy. Cause it, it just looks like I'm looking for a dirty push, push, uh, fish bowl. I'm crying. I'm going broke. Oh. All right. That's, that's a lot better. Uh, 44 Magnum Trucker. Lease purchase or operator isn't designed to succeed. Everyone wants to be an owner-operator until it's time to do owner-operator stuff. Yep, that, that, that could be true. That could be true. Um, you know, especially the guys that just jumped in it right off the bat, you know, have a couple months in um, of their CDL and stuff. They don't, they don't know what they're going to really, they just think that, you know, they see these guys out here with these uh, Peterbilt 379s and um, I don't know what you want to call it. Uh, the guys doing car carriers and stuff, they see these beautiful trucks and stuff. And they just think that, hey, yeah, owner operator, that's, that's, that's what I want to be. If they can afford them, they're making tons of money. Um, it, hell, for instance, I, I know plenty of guys where I live, driving by, they have night, they have bigger, nicer houses than I do, and they're, they're owner operators. And how, how half the time I see their truck in their driveway a lot more than probably out in the road, uh, you know, and they're obviously able to make it, you know, so I'm not saying that nobody can make it, but there's so much, 
so many people just out there all the time hustling and saying that, yeah, owner operator, this, and lease purchase this. And, um, they're making money off of you, you per se, the person that's doing these things, that's becoming owner operator and stuff. Um, you, you're getting manipulated. Uh, like, even, I wouldn't say technically here. Well, okay, I will say maybe here. Here, technically, I might be getting manipulated. Um, you know, I'm getting, look, look how long I've been sitting. I sat, what, from midnight? I got here at midnight. I sat from midnight to midnight waiting to deliver this load. Uh, you think Tyson's giving something like this to their company drivers, per se? Probably not because they're paying them. You know, if they sit so long, they end up paying them a certain rate. I don't get any, I don't get paid. I don't get paid to sit here. I don't get paid to, if I get detected in that store. So, you know, technically, maybe I'm getting used. I would not surprise me. Um, and also, Tyson doesn't have to take care of the truck too. I, it's all my problem. Uh, luckily, they do pay enough. You know, usually, like I said, I have had net settlements of seven, eight thousand dollars here. <laughs> even when everybody's complaining the spot market took a shit that, you know, covered, covered my bills, covered uh, bills that, you know, I was late on and things like, like I said, when the, the truck blew up, the old, the older truck blew up. Uh, that's why I said, if that truck would just lasted another month, I, I probably wouldn't have be I, for the last, what, six months now ish. I wouldn't be continuously complaining about, uh, you know, well, no, I wasn't really complaining about it in the beginning. I guess the last three or four months now that loads have become sparse, I guess. I won't be complaining about what I'm complaining about now. You know, or, or even putting out here that, well, no, I might still put out here, you know, about stress and, and what can happen to owner operators and stuff. But at least me personally, I wouldn't be enduring that so much uh, if I had the older truck. Uh, I probably would have, uh, well, I, I already did put new price papers on it, but I mean, I probably would have brand new shops on it by now. I probably would have put, uh, at least had somebody actually, like, uh, like NV alignment or something, actually check the front suspension out uh, and replace that stuff. You know, I would have done those things. I would have put new airbags on it. Uh, certain other things, like I kept going through blower motors or things kept falling into the blower motor and ripping the, the blower motor apart. I probably would have ripped the whole side of the interior out and went through all the, the vents, made sure there wasn't anything still sitting in the vents because I was so tired of, you know, taking the seat out, and checking, you know, putting new blower motors in and screwing around with uh, door servos and stuff because I was putting new door servos in. They were getting hung up. It was just, it was, it's a nightmare. Like to have to endure that every day or to like to go down south and sit in the heat and then have that happen or have the, you know, something fall inside the vent and blow, blow apart your blower motor. Now it's, 95 freaking degrees out you got no blower motor for air conditioner and you're stuck you know and you're sitting there you're like well i really wanted to i could just drive over to the ta there and have them order me a part and anything but do you really want to spend i don't know two two thousand dollars have that done have a 65 dollar part that you can get offline put in and then you know do the labor yourself well i mean i could do the labor myself but i mean it's like you're not, you're not just going to get that blower motor for $65. You have to go to a dealership or something and find it, and they're going to charge you two, three, four hundred bucks for it. So uh, it, it's just aggravation. Uh, aggravation, and, and it just gets you down all the time, you know? Yo, we got F8 trucking in the house. So how's those, uh, those bridge videos doing? Uh, I'm guessing you go to Jersey a lot. It's funny, I'm just touching the phone a little bit. It doesn't look like I'm jerking it. So I look over to the side of the TV and you can see the phone like. <laughs> um, let's see, Omar. Uh, I heard some owner operators make close to 400K a year during COVID. Is that true or an exaggeration? That's, that's probably true. I, I would say that's true because I was. I. But got in uh, near the end of August to April, and there when the truck when I didn't have problems with the truck, which eventually I did, there were times I was making four, four to five thousand dollars running from Chicago to Newark, New Jersey. And I wasn't getting them all the time though. I would have loved to be able to get a whole like, to, you know, put the knee knee pads on and talk to that broker if you know what I mean, 
and got that load all the time. There, at least there through that that time, it was you know coming. But I, I, you know, yeah, I didn't have that all the time. I might have got it like two or three times. That's it. Uh, so yeah, if you if you could continuously keep something up like that, yeah, you probably could make four hundred thousand dollars off the truck. But there's there's so many variables. There's also the variable whether or not you start getting lazy and wanting to go home all the time and, and taking weekends off and, and vacation and stuff. Uh, there's some probably specialized tanker drivers and car carriers that make like three three four hundred thousand dollars probably on a normal basis. Uh, definitely some heavy haulers. There's heavy haulers that make two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year and they only work maybe six months out of the year. So it's it, it is possible, but these are small small little niches. These are like the people. This this is like going to school and becoming a doctor. Uh, for like, let's say, say regular pediatrician or something, and then reading about these pediatricians and cops and stuff that are making like a million dollars a year, or three hundred or like four hundred thousand dollars a year, and you go and you go work for a practice and you get your check and you're making like, you know, one hundred and eighty, one hundred and fifty or something, and your student loans are two hundred thousand dollars or something. Like, you know, it's it's the same. It's the same thing. It's not everybody is just going to jump in here and start doing that. And, and also what I say a lot of time, it's about who you know more often than what you know. Usually who you know, whether or not they're able to put up with you, I guess. Like if you, you've got a dedicated customer or something or, or you know a certain broker or you know certain people feel a certain way about you. If you can get in on something like that and run it out, you know, you'll make you know, or, or being in the right place at the right time. Uh, you'll make, you make tons of money. You can, you can actually easily grow your business. Uh, look at, um, look at like, what is it? Bennett? Uh, is that right? Who it is? I guess the Bennett brothers. I don't remember. I'm, I'm trying to think about it. I want to make sure I'm picking the right carrier. I'm trying to talk about. I think it is Bennett. Look at them. They started out small, like everybody else. They got, they got in the right industries. They knew the right people. Things just worked out. And, you know, they put their hearts on it and look where they are now. They're like a multi-million dollar company. I'm sure the same thing kind of with Swift and stuff. I don't know the whole story behind Swift and, and all that. But, it, you know, that, that was also a different era, too. A lot, of, a lot of these older companies got in. And some of them were protected. You know, they were almost a little bit kind of monopolies, too, in the beginning because there they were certain lane leases and things like that that help them out but um it, it's it's if you're not putting like 110 percent into being an owner operator and and if you're not willing to grow um that too that well, i see a lot of owner operators they'll, they'll just stay a little little owner operator they'll have a few customers and then you know maybe they'll get away with three four five ten years um, things going great and they change overnight and you know they can survive for a while and then if they don't pick anybody else up or, or get that kind of momentum going with their business again you know even though they're one truck they they end up either retiring or they end up becoming a company driver again or parking the truck and becoming a company driver again yeah i've seen it before and and sometimes like i said if you get your authority and stuff and you know, you're out on just a regular spot market. Maybe you've got a few dedicated customers and you're not trying to ever grow uh, and become larger and become more self-efficient, I guess you could call it. But, you know, that you'll, you'll never be like, I mean, I guess this also depends on how you how your personal life goes, whether or not you have family and things like that. But you'll never be totally like monetarily independent uh, per se. Uh, Dan Schaefer, uh, restoration only works if you can do all the work yourself. Yes, that is true. And truck, uh, you know, I have a lot of tools still. I don't have all the tools that I used to have when I was an auto technician, unfortunately, that got stolen with a shop that I was doing cash work at, uh, which I think that was an inside job. But anyway, um, the, uh, you know, it, just, you, you need a lot of specialized, expensive tools. Um, you need an area uh, to do it. You need heavy equipment. Uh, like when I did, when I did my, I mean, if you go back a couple of videos, like I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 40 videos, I don't know. And you look up when I did the rear differential, my rear differential was uh, leaking on the, the uh, 49, I mean, uh, the 9400. 
and it had a crack in it, right where the, um, right around where the spring hanger is or whatnot. Uh, I pulled that out myself. Uh, I had a buddy of mine that was welded. He came in and he, he raised it, and welded it up and everything. Uh, and, you know, I pulled that out with a JLG in a garage that technically that garage was the pole yard that I used to do. Well, that was a lot of the time. I, I was still doing some dedicated loads for him, but that was the pole yard I was doing loads out of. And they let me use the garage and they let me use the, the, um, the telehandler. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to do that stuff myself at the house. Well, I'm going to drag it out with my pickup truck and I block the wood, hold the frame, you know, it, it just, um, you know, that it, it saved me so much money because I already spent, let's see, just before that, when I noticed the rear, the rear you know, one of the rears was cracked, uh, the power divider. I spent on a used power divider. This guy raped me. I spent $2,000 on a rear power, well, it's a pumpkin, you know, it's a, it's a power divider, everything all in one. $2,000 just for a junkyard power divider. And then I think he charged me $4,000 in labor and stuff to put it in and, and miscellaneous shit and whatever else. So I know I got, I, I got screwed. Uh, but it's not something you can just like go around and shop. You know, uh, you just have hearsay to say, hey, this guy, you know, kind of helped you out and stuff. And maybe he did. Maybe he did. Maybe I would have took it somewhere else and got screwed even more. Uh, I've heard some people talk about paying $10,000 for between putting a used power divider in and stuff. Uh, you know, that, that, that guy got screwed, probably. Uh, but it, it happened. You know, I, you can't control a lot of these shops. They'll give you an estimate. They'll give you a ballpark figure. And then it's, it's almost like the towing. You know, they'll, they'll tow the truck. Let's say, well, they're repairing the truck. And then you get the bill and you're like, holy crap. Well, either you pay it or you don't get the truck back, you know? Bone Rook Ryan, I'm, I'm just not understanding where all your guys' money goes. Um, well, now, Randall, technically, I should have money now, but I'm just not. Uh, my last settlement was $100. Uh, the truck was broken down before that. I, I got stuck on the north. Uh, well, technically, I would have money, all right? Um. On that last load, I got stuck with the multi-stop in Northbrook. But the problem is I still got to pay the truck payment. And um, I don't know if you were here a little bit earlier, but I'm still paying for the old load on the 9400 that I got too. So technically between the $480 I pay progressive for insurance on the truck, the, the truck payment itself, my old truck payment, and putting away two hundred dollars a week in maintenance now, and then you also got to take out taxes too. I I out of, I got that like automatically set up now through my bank. You know, I'm minus the taxes. I'm paying. I should have hard numbers down here, but I'd have to pull it up on the phone. Um, it's it's about like sixty two hundred dollars. I'd say I'm paying about sixty two hundred dollars a month just drive this truck around including the old the old bone on the other truck um including the like i said progressive insurance uh including putting money away still for maintenance and you just can't you can't touch that money you can't i mean i can touch it a little bit but the same thing with the taxes you can't touch like like i've had this before when i had the employees um when you look over your tax account and you see like you know, especially getting near the end of the year, you see like what twenty grand or something sitting in there. You're like, man, I got twenty grand in there. If anything goes wrong, I'll just pull money out and I'll pay it back. Well, the beginning first two or three years of me doing all this, I learned really fast and the hard way that is you just pretend that tax money isn't there. You just pretend it's gone. Um, because no matter when well, you know, whenever you go to do touch it for something bad that happens, uh you're not going to end up paying because you'll just potentially have bad things happen and uh, it's not going to go back. But I mean, um, I mean, you are right. You know, where does all the money go? Uh, but, but like I said, I don't have a new pickup truck. I don't have side by side. Um, I did have a new laptop. It was like 1800 bucks that I, well, luckily that thing was a piece of crap right out of the box and I took it back. But, uh, you know, that money ends up getting eaten up anyway here so i mean i i thought i thought i was set i was at least doing that 
for the YouTube channel and stuff like that, and just and uh, you know, bills and do QuickBooks and stuff. But um, you know, I'm just using the old lady's Apple, uh, old ass Apple uh, laptop. So, so uh, you know, I guess that's kind of where money can go. Uh, you know, when when sometimes when you have bad things continuously happen like this, and you you want to try to improve or do something, you think maybe if I spend money on something, it'll help me out time wise or doing something, and uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't always turn out that way. Uh, sometimes when you you gotta gotta be poor, you gotta be poor, I guess. You say. Um, Pablo, I bought uh, I bought mine already restored uh, for sixty k, and luckily, like everything is good. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But there's there's guys that go that think the same way as you, and they'll go out to uh, Ohio truck sales and stuff, and they'll pay sixty thousand dollars, and they'll think everything is good because it's all shiny and stuff, and it's all it's all a, a, a mirage. Technically, even my truck, the, the 9400, it, I knew it was what sticked up. I knew it was kind of rough, and especially when I had to get in the dash part and find out it used to pull out of the ports there. And, and um, well, where, where was it? Houston. It used to pull out of the Houston ports or whatnot. Um, right there was a good giveaway that this truck would probably have the shit kicked out of it and never really had anything done with it. So, you know, that, that I'm sure that contributed to a lot of it, too, and played a factor. No DEF, no ELD. Yep. Uh, FE. Everyone, uh, everyone experience is very different. Yes, yes, one hundred percent. Like you, I mean, uh, you know, you got two. I guess you still have two trucks now. I don't know around the grapevine or whatnot. But uh, you know, you probably didn't think anything like that was going to happen, or or that you you would end up back in a Mac or anything like that. Uh, it just it's just the way that you got to play your cards as you're dealt. I guess you could say. Uh, I guess wrong with Ryan. I guess he just posted what he made last year with 370, and that's gross, of course. Um, uh, no, it's not. I call Reaper. Yep. I think I think I've watched. Pretty sure I've watched Wrong with Ryan. Uh, some of your videos. I don't know why I can't put a pinpoint on what video I watched or whatnot, but I'm pretty sure I've watched it. Watch some of your videos. Uh, relationships don't fall on your lap. Yep, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, F eight hashtag reaper. Yep. Uh, Cheap Ray Holler. Good evening, everyone. Hey, what's up, Cheap Ray Holler? Uh, Cheap Ray Holler. Jackknife. Uh, how's your truck doing uh, since the visit to the shop? Um, it's doing great. I mean, I haven't really drove it that much, but it's done one regen so far and uh, i don't have no lights on or anything i guess like i said i don't exactly have the final work order back yet i don't know why not because when they were going to give it to me uh they said it uh it's got to be, be submitted to the warranty uh, for warranty claims and stuff so i'm they're supposed to just email me the work order um but they haven't yet i probably should call monday and see if they got the final work order yet but so far, what it looks like they only did is they changed six injectors. They did a they they did the one uh, the uh, they did an injector test. I guess a few of them failed, and then they did a couple other tests, a few other things, and they were still all failing. And they just replaced all the injectors with the updated injector set that they have uh, for these pack cards. So they they have a known problem with the injectors. I guess they're, they're clear, uh, the internal clearances are too small, and just apparently like little things or you know I don't know if it's necessarily stuff in the fuel what i think more is happening is the heat is atomizing the fuel and maybe certain detergents not detergents but um certain things they add to the diesel fuel maybe even you know the biodiesel it gets in there and it's so hot and there's such small clearances that i guess it can't dissipate heat and it turns into carbon and maybe that's what's causing the problem there's a there's a whole uh scientific uh paper, or not paper, but an article somewhere about it. I know a couple guys have already talked about it on my live. Hey, what's up, Janet Thomas? Good evening. Uh, McLeay, uh, thinking of selling my truck at a big loss and going to one year uh, HVAC school. Only have a few weeks uh, aside for the fall uh, yeah, fall uh, steam fitters, I guess. 
uh, trucking ain't looking good. Well, I I guess it depends what you're doing there, or you know, like what part of the trucking field you're in. I mean, it, it depends also on how big of a loss you're taking. Like if you're if you're just taking, I mean, I guess I assume you own your truck outright. Um, you know, that loss, you might be able to recuperate that. Uh, over time, but like I said, I don't know how much debt you might have already. Because I'm not saying that you do have debt, but don't get me wrong. I mean, usually, when owner operators start having things bad going, they just they'll whip out credit cards. They'll do this. They'll keep going. They'll think they'll make it, and it just it just piles up. Um, you know, if you feel that you know for yourself and your family that that's the way you could go, you know, I I would just do it. Do it, but don't don't do it if you think you're going to look back on it like you failed or, or you know you took a big loss uh, per se. Uh, you know that's something you're going to have to wrestle with. Uh, but at least that's that's how I feel about it. Like I said earlier, um, I don't man. I know these comments are probably flying in here. I'm probably way back. But like I said earlier, uh, me going doing that. I mean, I kind of would feel like like I took a step back. I mean, it depends how much money I was making. I guess if you wanted to call that, if I could take care of you know, losses I've already had and, and live comfortably, I probably would, would forget about trucking and be like, man, the stress, the stress is off my shoulders. Um, you know, there's no more feeling like, because when you're an owner operator, everything that you do is on you. There's no technically, you know, you can kind of blame dispatcher. You can kind of blame brokers and blame the economy and stuff, but ultimately it's on you. It, you're sitting there, you know, staring at the ceiling or out the window being like, what do I do? Um, how, how, you know, should I have done this differently? Should I maybe not took vacation like three weeks ago? Should this happen? This, that, this, this. And it's, it's all on you 24 seven, 365, especially if you have employees. Luckily I didn't have too many weird late night calls or anything or, or problems, but there are times, you know, uh, I got, you get the call. Hey, uh, it's, uh, pro star with the max force in it. It's, it's overheating. Oh, really? Well, first thing that popped in my head, hey, I'm sorry, not to it's a crappy max port that you took a gamble on because it was so cheap and you thought it would make you lots of money. And, um, you know, um, you, uh, what do you want to call it? You know that they have, I'm trying to remember, the EGR coolant issues. You know they have the EGR coolant issues. And, You know what? I think I does that sound better? I think I had uh, my headphone plugged into my monitor. Um, yeah. So, like I was saying, you you have the EGR uh, cool, cooler issues. They they have pretty much go to the dealership, and they cost you know it's, it's the whole job. They got to pull out the dashboard stuff. It, it's just a pain in the ass. And you get that phone call that, yeah, he's having phone calls. That's the first thing that popped in my head. And sure enough, that's, that's what it was. I ran the truck another month or two like that. And I pretty much, you know, in that month or two, I told him, hey, you know, they started slowing down on uh, our loads here, as you know. And it looks like they might be switching over to, you know, other smaller carriers or owner operators, paying them less. The truck, I know, is going to need a lot of work. It's going to be expensive. Maybe you want to start looking for somewhere to go. And, you know, we had a whole month or two to do that. And it was lucky I was able to get that, you know, that out of the truck. And the truck, um, the truck did pay for itself. It did. It barely made it paying for itself. Um, you know, I, I bought the truck. I paid $15,000 for the truck. It had 280,000 miles on it. And I got like six months out of it. Uh, maybe a little. No, maybe less. I got less. I, I can't remember. I just know it paid for itself. And. You know, I was kind of happy about that, and I should have tried to fix the truck, but, you know, they were, um, the bill was, we were looking at the bill at the international dealership, it's going to be like twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000. And I knew the truck didn't have no resale value, and, you know, it just, um, if, if I still had the account and things coming in the way they were, I would have fixed the truck. Uh, but, 
you know, I was trying to already like cut, cut my losses and I didn't want to screw anybody in the process. Uh, you know, my two employees or whatnot. Hello, that's not gross. My trick, uh, this is Ryan, uh, Ron or Ryan. Uh, my trick is to focus on uh, agriculture to extent flows. So, yeah, you, so you're running a mile. Uh, I guess, um, yeah, you, you know, no, uh, no ELD and everything. Uh, simply built. Later to uh, yeah, late to the live show. But how po how is it po oh, yeah how how possible is it uh, for you to get out of that twenty twenty three KW? Uh, as impossible as I end up finishing the, the four years off that I owe on it, because that too the the uh, the four years is uh, you know it's compact, so it's not like a regular like six year six year loan or whatnot. Um, Amount of down payment and credit stuff played a little role in that. I mean, technically, maybe I, I probably could trade it in. Maybe um, I don't know how that would go. Uh, I'm sure I would take a hit per se. I guess it just depends. Uh, but you know, there's a possibility to that. Uh, McLean, uh, no debt. Uh, yeah, he was talking about earlier about getting uh, getting out of the truck and going to HVAC. You know what? I would do it. To be honest with you, if you're not stressed out and you feel that things are going that bad downhill, I would I would probably uh, it's still it's up to you, but I would probably do it. And that way, if you do want to go back to trucking or whatnot, you can. But you have you have the ability um, the ability to have a different skill and make money in that skill. Um, and who knows? Maybe your CDL might even come in handy with uh, with something. Uh, you know, if you're doing HVAC, maybe you'll know, you'll be driving a larger vehicle around or something for the HVAC company or something like that. Uh, it all it all depends. Uh, rolling with Ryan, uh, a lot of miles, uh, minimum home time, and I drive 55 for fuel economy. Yep, yep, you are. Well, you're hustling in a different way, I guess you could say. Like I said, there's two ways I consider hustling. There's hustling, and then there's hustling others, I guess you could say. Uh, let's see. Shannon, had a fun day in Wisconsin. Met up with Wheelburner and Nomadic Brit. Awesome time. Yeah, that's great. You know, that, 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 that too. I miss that too. Like I said, I'm doing a lot of local, like not local, but local regional-ish, and I don't get anywhere near anybody anymore they're mostly the guys stay in the midwest uh like i said nobody wants to come over to the northeast except for probably f8 uh maybe eventually one day i'll run into him but for the most part i'm i'm kind of alienated from the whole group i guess you could say uh mcleigh i got charged four hundred dollars for guy to come out and put free on in my home unit uh, I'd love to be able making that kind of money in an hour and a half. Well, you got to remember though, just because you got charged four hundred dollars, because like I said, I used to be an auto mechanic. I was an auto mechanic at a Jaguar uh, Jaguar dealership, and their labor rate was, I think, one hundred fifty dollars a time. And you know what I made? Like twenty dollars an hour flat rate. Um, actually, no, less than that. I think it was eighteen an hour flat rate. Working on, I don't know, $112,000 Jaguar, XJ8, Oreo edition, stuff like that. Um, and then, of course, we get used cars in. Sometimes we get, um, I don't know why, but we've had people trading Ferraris and stuff for Jaguars. I, I don't know. Maybe they change their family set. I don't, I don't know. But, you know, we get used cars in, and I'd work on it. We're $200,000 used cars, $10,000 used cars. And here I am, you know, and I'm sure... People are getting charged for that too. Uh, we had a guy who used to bring a Bentley in. He had another. He had his own, He had a. He had a Jaguar. I guess he just had the. Um, uh, I guess the helper or whatnot. Take the kids to school on it and stuff. And he had a Bentley, and he would bring the Bentley in, and I'd work on it. And I'm sure they charged him out the ass for that. And I, you know, I didn't see that money. Um, 
I mean, I guess if you're going to start your own HVAC business, that's that's different. But um, you know, you just got to look at it that way, I guess. But you are right, though. There are so many more businesses uh, other than trucking where you're. It's uh, the profit margin. The profit margins are, are just just a couple percentage uh, more in profit margin, and the, the lack of extra bills because you're, you're relying on other people to repair your everybody screws the owner operator now when you're a bigger company you have a little bit more say like like swift and stuff can pretty much make or break a company if they say hey you don't want to repair it for this much you don't want to at least make this much percentage we'll go somewhere else we'll take our whole fleet somewhere else and we'll go you know have these other people fix it so they can make and break a whole company but when you're a small fleet or an owner operator they Anybody they want to take advantage of, um, they could just, you know, name their price. And, um, you know, there's so many other businesses where, like I said, the profit margins are so, so much more in your favor. Um, and the cost, the cost of running it are so much less expensive or, or maybe you could, you know, if it's like a smaller vehicle, you can fix it yourself, things like that. And, uh, look at VLOC. Look at VLOC's AT. You think he really, you know, technically wanted to walk away from that truck? Uh, I mean, he didn't walk away, but you know what I mean. He made a smarter financial business decision. He looked at it and said, you know, look, where I'm at, I don't want to be scraping by or having all these problems as an owner-operator. Uh, he got into something that, well, the way the economy is going, it's going to flourish right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, he made a smart business decision. He said, I had enough of these, this kind of profit margin. I want to do something that, you know, I could practically put on autopilot, I guess you could say. You know, he still has to work, but I'm saying he doesn't, he, does, he got rid of all that stress, all that worry. And uh, like I said, there's so many other businesses out like that. Like te technically, I was hoping to use this a little bit as a stepping stone. Like when I did have a couple of employees, I was eventually hoping to either open up a used car lot uh, with some of the extra cash flow or maybe get into some real estate, uh, you know, things that, I guess you want to say, like I said, the things that the profit margins are higher on. Uh, Freedomworks, Max Works engine had EGR enhanced exhaust gas restriction. Yes, yes. Like I said, it was so cheap, I just took a chance on it, and it did pay for itself. I just figured if it, if it went longer, uh, you know, it, 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 was, it was just a pure money maker at that point because it, I bought the truck so cheap. And, and technically, it was a pure money maker. I just had things, certain, the, the carrier, I mean, not the carrier, the, uh, the customer I had, just, just things snowballed all at once. I just had a lot of, lot of bad, you know, business problems, per se, happen all at once. And that's, that's kind of like what, what uh, made that a very bad decision to buy that truck? I uh, Freedom Works, but I think Max Worth Space Engine was Caterpillar. Yes, uh, no, it was International's own thing. Yeah. The, the only, the only what you're thinking about is the Cat truck, and they just Cat was hoping that the whole EGR thing, non, I mean the EGR thing would go because Cat didn't want to do the DEF and all that stuff. So they're hoping they could like branch off of that idea and do all that. You know, keep the, the caterpillar engines the way they were practically and stuff, but that whole thing just turned into a, a shit show. It was, it was, it was everybody trying to come up with an idea to meet the EPA regulations, and the EPA just did not give everybody a long enough time to actually do, I guess, research and and testing and stuff in it. That's just that whole that whole error right there was a shit show with the mess. Uh, from what 2010 to like 2000, probably up to about I would say about 15, 16 is where it kind of became somewhat reliable. Uh, but even now, it's yeah, I guess technically now it's somewhat reliable. Like I said, you could still have problems with it. Freedom Works, but I think and that yep, he just I just read that one. Uh, Freedom Works again. If you delete the EGR and all the other emissions from the Max Force, you had a good engine. Yes, I did hear that. Uh, because, you know, technically it was as non-emissions as you could probably get at that time. But 
finding guys that wanted to delete them or would delete them was a little hard in my area. I probably could have went down to like Texas and stuff, just, um, things like that. It just wasn't, it wasn't feasible at that point where I decided it probably needs to be deleted. And uh, that's what happened there. But that ultimately what I should have done is on day one, looked and found somebody to delete it, took five grand or three grand and drove the truck way out somewhere and had them do it. And that's what I should have done. And um, I, I, I did. I just, I just figured I would get a certain amount of time out of it. And when time came to fix it, you know, it would have been at the right time and I would have had plenty of money to do it. And it would just been worth keeping uh, until, you know, until something major the end happens or something. Freedom Works is saying hi to Shannon. Oh, man, I must be really far, far, far behind. Um, um, let me go. Let me go up real quick. Uh, put a thumbs up if you just want me to skip over a bunch of people. But uh, like I, said, I don't know how far. Oh, I guess I'm not that far behind. Let me let me buzz out these comments real quick. Uh, slippery built. Max Force was fine. Engine let down by the. Yep, they let down by the emission system around it. The upgrade. Uh, well, the one thing I didn't like about the that that Max Force though was that uh, oil oil controlled fan clutch. That think that was pretty dumb. But anyway. Uh, they upgraded and updated all that and called it an N13, which is what I drive. I love my N13, super quiet and pretty efficient. You know, I looked at a few N13s, but I was so scared um, that they were basically updated, like they were going to be updated problems for the N13 um, that I didn't bother looking or buying. I'm going to turn this up on. It's getting hot in here now. But, um, yeah, I looked at them, and you know, I was just was scared, just like everybody else. Still was scared of the what the what is that the end? Um, the twenty eight A or something like that. Just in the LTs, people are still scared, and they think they're junk. And also another thing, though, is since it's you know, inter just like the problem I have here with Paxar, you know, it's a uh, manufacturer only engine, so a lot of software stuff is like dealership only for the, for the, emission, for the computer, the emission uh, the diag and stuff like that. So. Stand up too loud. Freedom Works. Uh, when you uh, when you were a mechanic, were you a snap on or a Mac man? Um. Well, we didn't really get the Mac guy come around that much. I was a snap on guy until I discovered Cornwells and they started showing up. And then I was Cornwells because the tools were, you know, I don't know, probably about 30 to 40% cheaper. Uh, I bought a lot of Cornwells. And then I got smart when Harbor Bay Freight started coming around and started buying Harbor Bay Freight. So, because what I was making on a good year, I think I made like 65000 a year there. And my snap-on snap -on bill at one point was like $30,000. Or twenty six thousand, something like that. So yeah, that's the the, the amount of money I had to spend on tools, and, and especially some of the specialty tools I had to buy. Uh, you know, it just didn't it, it didn't make real sense. Like even now, I don't know how people are auto mechanics now. Uh, the only the only way I can think is that some of these guys get into the dealerships in a, re, uh, a metropolitan area and they do a lot of work and they can afford to pay some of these guys because they're they're desperately hurt for technician. That's the only way I can think some of these guys are making good, really good money. But if you're out in like a normal suburb or like heading with the Jaguar dealership, I was out with like in a normal suburb. You know, you weren't you weren't really making any money. Now, when I went to training with a few guys that were out of, you know, Jaguar dealerships out of D.C. or North Jersey and stuff, they were making $100,000 a year. Easy. So some of the younger, newer guys were making like what I was making. And I was in it for like 10 years. 
So if I would have moved and went somewhere else, maybe yeah, I could have made more money as a you know technician or something. Freedom works. I always loved back tools over Snap on and Mac. Yeah, Mac out. Hey, Mac, Mac and Mac are the same, right? Yeah, they are. Um, let's see here. Roll with Ryan. I came to trucking from owning a home service business. Trucking is way easier. Yep, way easier to make money. Super contact. I'm getting all blurry again. Way easier to make money. The problem where something, the problem where, with something like HVAC is your. Oh, there you go. Your marketing budget. We were spending six figures a year on that. Well, that be also because you had, if you think about it, uh, you know, there's a lot of competition in HVAC and, and all that. Uh, you know, if your name isn't out there. And people just don't know to call you. You're you're not making money. That that too. Uh, it's almost like trucking, though, the same way. If you're not calling people up, and uh, well, like I said, trucking trucking has became very competitive here lately too. Um, it, it it's a crapshoot, really. Either way, it's just in my opinion, when you do something like that. And if you don't, like, let's say you get enough word of mouth or you get in a certain area, but let's say you're not competing with a bunch of other, you know, uh, contractors or HVAC work or whatever you do, you can pretty much, like, the business will practically stay on autopilot with you know, word of mouth and just normal marketing, you know, some Facebook stuff, like Angie's list and stuff. But if you're, if you're in a really competitive market and you got to get your name out there like 24 7 and you know uh hustle customers into taking your quote i guess you know you got you got some work ahead of you rolling with ryan one one line uh, item a month to keep employees moving yep use car a lot is a great business uh, yep, yeah. Used car lot is a great business, but you need a lot to get it off the ground. That's my next move. I sold cars for a year. Yeah, I sold cars too. Uh, a little bit after I got out of the, uh, the automatic, uh, yeah, the, uh, the repair side, I, I sold cars. I sold cars for about a little over a year. I was doing pretty good, and then they decided, hey, we are going to stick you in uh, a Hyundai Suzuki dealership. And by the way, we kind of want you to push these Suzuki because we can't sell. And uh, that that was kind of what broke my back with uh, selling cars and uh, trying to sell Suzuki. Um, motorcycles, probably no problem. But cars, yeah, nobody nobody really cared. What, so. And even at the time, Hyundai, this, this is back when the Sonata just came out, like the Sonata and stuff just came out of that goofy looking like mini Rolls Royce, the weird, I don't know, it was just, like the X350s and stuff they used to have. It was just out of that phase when they were just coming into the Sonatas that looked past like these, like a car. And uh, the Hyundai, the Hyundai Elantras were still that goofy looking, like cheap, I don't know, what do you want, Japanese looking car, I guess, or Korean car. So it was really, it, it was, uh, it was a little bit of a handful. Yeah, the A26. Uh, uh, simply built A26 in the LP. I'd like to try one uh, of these, these days. Yeah, but I mean, I like I said, I hear a lot of, I don't know. The whole thing, though, is if the software was more readily available, like Cummins and stuff, a lot of these, a lot of these dealer, uh, dealer, but, uh, oh, what do you want to call it? Manufacturer engine only options they, they probably would be easier to put them out of the market people wouldn't be as worried about having to get screwed by the dealer but you know it's it, i remember when the emissions first came out even the dealerships were like this sucks uh, we're losing customers everyone getting yelled at all the time now now it's a different tune now they don't care now they love these things breaking down all the time they're making money hand over fist now and it's pretty much just like printing money now. and they can charge whatever they want 
especially if it's like dealership only, you know, it's like not a Cummins if it's because you can't go anywhere else. You can't go to these smaller shops that, that you know, don't have an overhead or, or maybe don't need that uh, that extra amount of cash coming in, I guess you could say. You're stuck at a dealership and you're going to pay their diagnostic fees. You're going to pay for all that dealership only software and everything like that. Home hotels are great. Yep. Yes, they are, Freedom. Freedom works. Uh, Maco is affordable. Uh, uh, Mac, Maco is an offshoot of Mac Pools. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. I thought it was all one thing. I would assume they were. Freedom works. Uh, stupid contact. Uh, I haven't been a mechanic in many years. I would I would hate to think what those Mac Snap on and Maco tools would cost nowadays. I think last time I priced out a Snap on toolbox, like a a small one, like a forty six inch toolbox, I think it was like six, seven grand for the one. When I remember them being like twenty eight, maybe three, four grand, stuff like that. They've doubled the price just about. Uh, but then again, I don't that might that's either because well inflation or because they have more competition now too, so they need a higher markup on them. Cause me personally, I mean, if you really wanted to get in a snap on toolbox, you're gonna to get a snap on toolbox to kill tools, or you're just gonna take the whole toolbox down. So why if you can get a four, five, six hundred dollar uh Harvey Freight or uh do is it or a husky toolbox to do the same damn thing just buy it you know the specialty tools that no one else makes or you have to go to snap on or back but for everything else generally unless it's like cheap amazon tools or or you know the cheap harbor bay freight like the super cheap ones you know you're pretty much you can get all you can get away with doing it you know it's more of a it, it's more of a Looking professional, everybody else, not necessarily like one upping everyone else, but looking, looking like you know what you're doing. When people see somebody show up with like a Harvey Freight toolbox and stuff, the initial thing is either it's the first year or this guy is just some slapped together mechanic that doesn't know what he's doing, which is it's just it's, it's bullshit, really, what it is. It's much BS. Uh, it's like the iPhone. The iPhone, Android debate, and everything else. You like iPhone? It's good. I'm glad you have an iPhone. The reason I never got an iPhone is the first iPhone. I think I bought one many years ago. The thing would lock up all the time, and I had to wait for it to die because you couldn't pull the battery out. Well, now they're all like that. And But that first generation of iPhone or whatever I had, it put a bad taste in my mouth, and I'll, I'll never buy one again. Oh, wait. I did end up buying one. The wife did talk me into one. And I didn't like... I didn't like how most of everything was, I don't know, all the software was paid, not the software, all the apps seemed like they were paid apps. And I didn't like how some of the apps were different compared to their Android counterpart. So I got rid of it, but I don't know, maybe I would have kept it. Uh, but, the, you know, that's the example I'm trying to give there. Rolling with Ryan. LL sold Suzuki's as well, hard to sell. Yeah, yeah, I'll say. You know what, though? They were, uh, I ended up driving in it, uh, what was it, an SX4 for a little bit? It was, a, you know, it was all-wheel drive. It did great in the snow. It was a cute little, not cute, but I mean, it was a little car that, that did almost anything you could ask of it. Uh, at least that's what I thought. It wasn't really the best-looking car. It was, it, just, it was very practical, I guess you could say. Uh, if I was, like, 16 and I just had a, well, I guess you could buy anything else. But, but you know, I had, uh, had to choose on a low car payment, and something would get around and all those drive and this car good on gas. I probably would have took an SX4. Then again, I probably would have bought like a Mustang or something, to be honest with you. <laughs> Simply built, my international dealer here in KC does decent usually. I like them a lot better than Freightliner dealer, way faster and nicer to make. Yeah, it depends where your Freightline dealer is. Like, if you're in some of these areas, the Freightliner dealer is just swamped all the time. Um, whether they're selling stuff, they're, they're fixing stuff. The Freightliner dealer out by where our, I reside, uh, there's what is that, uh, Dunmore? Is that Dunmore Freightliner? I think it's Dunmore, Sherwood, Dunmore, uh, and then they build a new one over in uh, 
and by that pilot, I forget what that pilot is there, uh, what the name of that is, that little town or whatever. But it's off of 80 by the, the, this little shitty pilot that gets full all the time. Uh, this is another Sherwood freight liner. You know, they're always usually able to get you in pretty quick. But they're, you know, they're kind of in a, they're, they're not near where the mega carriers are. They're not, they don't have a mega carrier next door. Like, what is it? Uh, Maverick. There's a huge freight liner dealership next to Maverick. And they're swamped all the time. You know, have, they, they, they order all the trucks from Maverick. They all come through there. And, uh, you know, it's, you're, if you're just an owner operator, you're going to get slow service there, I imagine. So, uh, I, I'm going to probably cut this at 10, 10 o'clock. But, uh, I don't know. Anybody, uh, well, I've already been talking. I mean, we already kind of come to the conclusion that, you know, I'm not in the best shape financially or business wise, I guess you could say. Uh, but, you know, I plan on coming out the other end of this fine uh depending but like i said in trucking there's a lot of variables that necessarily you're not in control of uh you know if, even if i was on the spot market and had my own authority if i had my own authority maybe uh when it did get slow here i could run some spot market freight that's if technically uh you know i would have been allowed to ish i mean i would have been allowed to but i might have you know step on some toes, you know what I mean? Because I wouldn't necessarily be totally available for Tyson toes. But, you know, I might, I might, at least I would have been able to bring in a, uh, some kind of income instead of making a hundred dollar settlement or something. But, you know, then the, then the truck is broken down. So that's, that's not going to really work for you either. Uh, and, and technically that wasn't a hundred dollar settlement either. It's just the way I look at it. I still, I have these bills at the end of the month. That you have to that have to get paid. So it, it, with my eyes, that money's gone. Whether you know that's that's budgeting, I guess within your business is really important too. Because if you get if you get let's say you get one week where you have a good week and you get a six or seven thousand dollar net or whatever, and then you have let's say something happens and you don't work for two weeks or you got very like one or two loads, that money for that first week needs to get dedicated to your bills business bills, you know, at the end of the month and stuff. You can't just go out, put that money, uh, you know, in the account and switch it over to your personal account. Like, let's pay off some credit cards. Let's do this. Let's do that. And then all of a sudden, you know, oh, I got, I got, you know, $6,000 worth of payments at the end of the month. Um, you know, I've seen that happen. In fact, I've kind of had that happen to me. You know, I started like saying, let's pay down debt. I'm making some good money now. And then you don't foresee that those events happening down the road per se freedom work hang in there boss keep up all the great work uh you're doing uh, you're doing i'm um, oh yeah keep up all the great work you're doing i'm rooting for you yeah th i mean it uh thanks i mean it is what it is like i said i'm not trying to uh, I, I don't want this to feel like like you know i want a pity a pity break for me I just uh, figured I would come out and say, pretty much say how it is. Uh, because nobody really came to me when I first got in here, as, as obvious, obvious, you know, as my little bit of tax problem I'm still dealing with. Nobody came in when I came in this and told me, like, straight out uh, BS it would happen as being an owner operator, uh, getting into your own business truck. I was told things to flim flam and, uh, you know, make more money uh, per se you know i had bad mentors i guess you could say and youtube at the time i mean i just simply didn't really look at trucking youtube that much or at least the educational side of i guess when i was at prime i watched a couple prime videos that's really when i started getting into watching you know trucking videos per se and you know most of them are just the regular prime kool-aid videos just like the prime kool-aid videos you have now and uh I still actually, I, I, if I had a laptop, I'd bring it up. I have somebody that I know that sent me a settlement from Prime doing a lease purchase. And it, 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 it's just very eye opening. It probably opened a lot of people's eyes up on, you know, getting into a lease purchase with Prime and stuff like that. Uh, so it probably would help out a lot of guys. So I just, hopefully, I don't forget about that. 
whenever I do somehow decide to get a laptop. Um, it's pretty much way on the back burner. It's not that I couldn't go buy one right now. It's that, you know, like I said, the money that's, that's rolling around in my bank account is, is there. It's there to pay what I need to pay. And uh, I'm just automatically assuming everything's going to go work. So I automatically assume, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that the light's going to come on any minute now. And the truck's going to need to tow somewhere. Uh, I'm assuming that I'm going to get stuck on this three load, uh, this three, this uh, yeah, three stop run. I'm assuming something's going to get wrong. I'm just going to turn into like a three day run instead of a. Uh, well, technically, technically, it is a three day run because let's see, I'm sitting here right now waiting for midnight to deliver. Then uh, I have a delivery at seven in the morning. Then I have a delivery at seven in the morning on Tuesday at. Uh, performance food group or no not performance it's cisco uh over by uh, uh northbrook northbrook so it's uh you know it's already longer than i want it to be but i'm hoping by tomorrow they already have the next load ready for me when i drop off cisco and i can just leave there and, and keep rolling but at least this week i'm making money it's just you know this money, this this if after this check, uh, it's getting near the end of the month. All this money is going to basically go to the truck payment, and you know whatever's left over is my you know I have to wait to the end of the month to figure out what I'm actually going to pay myself this time. I can't just take something out during the week because it's not there, or like I said, something might happen. Uh, simply built. Have you looked into going somewhere else? What you see that uh, what 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 do you see that pro uh, what I see that's promising? Um, as in here, what I see that's promising, or anywhere else? Because I mean, anywhere else? I mean, unless I have somebody that can like vouch for some somewhere, like I'm probably not going to move anywhere because I don't know. I I see what the spot market's doing. I know it's horrible. Uh, you know, unless somebody can come forward and be like, look, I got the hookup. You come here, you do this, you'll make this. It's, you know, because technically that's what this was. This was a hookup, uh, per se. And, right, you know, there's a, it so happens, everything snowballed at the worst time. The truck started having problems. I started having problems with, uh, you know, loads coming through very sporadically. And it just, it snowballed into this little, little problem. Uh, Right now, I'm probably over exaggerating how bad it is for myself a little bit, but at the same time, I'm not because, like I said, if anything were to happen and continue down this road, by the end of the month, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, uh, on way borrowed time, I guess. Right? So that's uh, that's that's how to put it bluntly, I guess. Right? So this is what I know right now. This is what I'm hoping to continue the way it is. But like I said, it's something that happens across uh, anything. You know, it's 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 a it's a fact. I'm just as long as everything goes all right and I continue down the path and the, the rest of the week goes the way I'm hoping it's going, you know, I'll be fine, I'll pull out of this. It's gotta last another month of normal, you know, uh, everyday normal runs and reliability to trust. And you know, I'll probably forget I even had well not forget that I had conversation but you know i'll forget the stress i'll forget thinking about it uh you know just be me with my sunglasses on falling down the road you know making my money listening to i don't know russell flats or something <laughs> you know it'll just it'll just be a normal day but until that happens until i can see that i'm out of the you know i don't have no problems with the truck i don't have you know i have a decent amount of freight coming in i'm doing the, you know deep loads until that continues to happen i i feel like i I'm planning for the work, uh, per se. Freedom Works. How much is how much is your truck payment weekly or monthly? It I treat it I treat it weekly uh, because it's such a it's such a big payment. It's between between the insurance. Well, it's pretty much it's forty eight hundred. And then you have the insurance, and then you have the two hundred dollars I put away for for the maintenance and everything. So 
you know, you're well, you're all well over five thousand dollars. Plus, I'm still paying on the old truck too. That's a that's nine hundred fifty bucks. Say, James, do you run? Uh, do you only run northeast slash east of the Mississippi? I only, well, I only run the east coast now, basically northeast. Uh, when I first got here, I would go down to, I would deliver a lot of times, I would deliver to, I remember the Walmart DC. Uh, shit, I can't remember where it's at. It, it was the Walmart DC in North Carolina. Uh, and I can't remember which one it was. But I would, I would just run 81 pretty much down to this Walmart DC. Uh, and, you know, I, I was making great miles. I would go there, and then usually they would send me over to uh, Hill, uh, Indiana. I'd pick up at a plant in Indiana and then run back to run back to Pottsville. And I was; those were like three. I mean, those were like I guess they were like ten thousand dollar gross check. And then net, I was net probably like with that truck, the older truck. I was net probably like seventy two. I was well, the fuel like on a small head on the truck, but um. Now it's probably net like seventy two hundred dollars, and that only lasted until the truck blew up. And then, you know, I had a whole almost month or more than a month where I didn't have no income coming in. And then I got this truck at the beginning of the year, and I ran a few of those loads just like that a little bit, where I was actually getting a bunch of miles, like three thousand miles, twenty eight hundred miles a week. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it just stopped. And it kind of went down to a triple, went down to 2,000 miles, 1,800, 16. Uh, there for a while, the last couple of weeks there, I was only doing like 1,200 miles, even at almost $3 a mile or 280 a mile. You know, when you're only doing 1,200 miles or 1,000 miles, nothing. I forgot. I'm not tapping on the, tapping on the comments. Um, Butch, uh, oops, let's go. best advice I got 26 years ago was do what, do what, I know that's not, do what not, not yet. do what not money big, do, was do was, hold it, best advice I got 26 years ago was do what not money big companies are into and is and is a good paying off big time. Okay, yeah, not do what big money paying companies are into and has paid off big time. So just not doing what uh, the freight is like, I guess, uh, you know, Prime and, well, Prime does a lot of stuff, but I mean, uh, like Swift, uh, J.B. Hunt, not not try to compete with them is what you mean. Get into the niche, the niche market. Uh, like, oh, you know, a lot of oversized, a lot of specialty stuff, uh, bull hauling, things like that. Although I will have to say, though, over the last couple of years, I've seen J.B. Hunt pulling a lot of weird different trailers. I've seen him pulling scrap metal. I've seen him pulling flatbed stuff. Um, I've seen him pulling uh, dairy tanker. I'm pretty sure it was a dairy tanker. But, yeah, you know, other people, other companies, tankers and stuff like that and, and trailers. So, I mean, you know, who knows? In a couple of years, J.B. Hunt might do it all. Uh, James, uh, do, uh, do you have an opinion to run? Uh, do you have an option to run elsewhere? I'm OTR with some. I'm OTR with the company based out of uh, Fayette, Fayetteville, the uh, trend, and uh, and trends to stay out of the Ohio since I got the 2024. Um, well, I don't know. I guess that depends on on the dispatch here and what. Bison gives out, or what dispatch decides to give me. I mean, I to be honest, at this point, I'm fine with almost being over the road uh, because technically, I'm still going to end up at the DC there in Pottsville, so I'm still going to get home a good amount of time. But it's, uh, I you know, it's kind of out of my control. It's whatever, whatever the loads or dispatch out of Bison, whatnot. Uh, that's that's just how they fall. And I guess whoever's available at the time those loads come out. So, Chris, 
Freedom Works. Yeah, thank you for the show. You know, I mean, I'm just, I don't know. I'm, uh, this is just thrown together. Like I said, this is not as professionally as I would like it to be. Um, I don't have things planned out. I'm just rolling off the cuff, per se. I know a lot of stuff. I repeated it uh, multiple times. I've said probably um 23 times, 23,000 times. Then I had a problem with the camera, too. That was, that was a little bit ridiculous. But it's... Uh, I guess I just don't want anybody to feel like they're alone. Uh, not alone. I mean, that's kind of sounds. But now I'm turning into uh, what do you want to call it? Lifetime Network or whatever. I don't. I don't want anybody to feel that they're alone in this. That this this is the shit that has happened. Nobody wants to talk about it on YouTube. Nobody wants to go into it in detail. I mean, I'm not going to like show you my. Well, I guess they did text me, but I mean, I'm not gonna, like you're not going to see my bank actual full numbers and stuff. What I have in my personal account and stuff. But I mean. Uh, uh, I'm at least going to put it out there on, you know, what can happen and will happen. Uh, you know, there's guys, like I said, there's some guy like the, uh, I forgot, uh, was it Jose? Uh, the one he said he bought the, the classic, uh, freight liner. He, he, he has no, he bought it for 60 grand. He's had no problems with it all the time. Then, like I said, there, when I had the Cascadia, I put like 390,000 miles on it, about 380. In. Not, not one thing. There's guys who'll do that, and they'll just have all that money, constantly, not a, not a care in the world. And then there's people like me that are poets that whatever I touch turns to shit. You know, it's just, um, it just happens that way. Now, I only can go by what I personally, you know, like things that broke on the truck. Did I check them? Yeah, I checked them. I was looking. Things usually happened while I was driving. Um, you know, it was it was things that. That I couldn't see, like you can't see inside the engine. Even though I had oil, I got oil samples on this, this truck, and there, you know nothing came back negative. Um, I couldn't see inside the actual differentials on the truck. You know, it's just it just shit happens. That's just a, you know, there's nothing, no way you can you know plan for that. When shit happens, it happens. I'm gonna go through these last comments, and then I'm gonna probably pop off here. If you have any, I mean, unless somebody has a question or something, I you know I don't mind stay, you know bullshit a little bit more. But, uh, you know, if I'll, I'll be here, like, just about midnight, you know, reading comments and talking. Um, like I said, this is, this, I'd rather do this than, I don't know, just watch TV or uh, sit here and think about maybe where I can go or, like I said, uh, go through Indeed. You know, just, um, I'd rather do this, help some people, uh, Put a little content out there, and just, you know, other than sitting in the truck staring out the window, you know. Uh, James, the money and miles are okay-ish, but more than you've been doing lately. Yep. Um, but it's, uh, vegetables has a lot of money in it. Yes, they do, but so does meat. Actually, reefer in general usually has a decent amount of money in it right now. Um, it just depends whether or not you're letting yourself get taken advantage of. Uh, Freedom Works, I need to turn in for the night. Good night. Hey, good night, Freedom Works. You know, it's nice talking to you. Thanks for all the comments and everything. Um, oh, I guess if you can, I, I should have said this when I had like 30 people in here. Uh, you know, like, uh, subscribe if you're new here. I mean, Eventually, I'll probably put something out that you want to watch or, or might be interested in or, or, you know, help you with. Uh, let's see, James. I guess James will probably be the last comment here unless, like I said, anybody else has, a, like, a question that they really need help with. Uh, James, I guess uh, I guess that making sense since you live up there. I haven't even uh, seen Pottsville since October. That used to be a biweekly stop for me. Tyson freight has gotten short lately. Yes, yes, it has. Like I said, um, I talked to the, I don't know why my notes are sticky. I talked to the, uh, the security guard and the lady at the window over here at the DC, and they said they haven't seen it this slow in a long time. Well, the one lady in the window never seen that slow. But the lady, the security guard, uh, said, uh, I mean, the lady in the security uh, shack said that, uh, you know, usually there's 100 to 200 trucks a night that come in and out of there. She's like, she said they could get like 30, 50. You know, something like that lately. Um, I think a few nights ago, she said it got up to like 120. 
but it's just it's been really slow lately. Uh, so, like I said, I think that's more of a, uh, a reflection of the economy than it necessarily really like, unfortunately. CR, yeah, CRL is letting too many people in, and Tyson already has a big fleet on top of that. Freight slowed down, so no one is getting uh, any miles anymore, not even the Tyson drivers. Uh, I, I did talk to a Tyson driver when I was, you know, when I was in the, uh, well, I guess he was new, so, but he kept breaking down, so he wasn't getting any, I couldn't believe how, like, I mean, his, he probably went two or three weeks only made, making like $100 or something. Um, I don't know how he's doing it. But um, but you are right. They did hire. They did hire too many people, uh, especially for this possible one. And they did get rid of. They did get rid of a lot of people. Um, I hate to say. I mean, I hate to say it, that the problem was most people that got hired through them didn't go directly to their office down there in Arkansas. So they only got really their name and you know what year make their truck was. They didn't exactly get a snapshot of them personally or the way the truck looked or anything so i think that played a big role in it because there was a lot of goofy stuff going on um you know just like any other company they kind of hire too fast and then realizes like because like i said i think our i think it affected because now we're also safety has gotten on us here uh the last couple months too so i think there's a lot of guys that screwed up a lot you know what i mean Yo, what's up, Trucking Reviews? You're pretty much coming in here as I'm just about getting out of here. So I, I will talk to you for at least a second here in a little bit, and, and then I'll probably scoot out of here. Um, we are doing good at JBF. Well, that's good. You guys need an owner-operator? <laughs> oh. But, uh, yeah, I don't know what kind of meat you guys. I guess you do a lot of pork, right? JBF is a lot of pork. Pork. Forks a, uh, a forks in like everything. So, uh, well, no, I think JBS does beef too, though. Maybe two, maybe two what? Maybe two what, James? Oh, you mean maybe two that they hired too many people and like the wrong people. All pork. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're right. JBS does all pork. Yeah, that's what I, but pork's, pork's, you know, pork's in a lot of stuff. Hot dogs. Um, you know, I guess it's just, uh, it's also a cheaper meat. So I don't know. That might be, that might be it too. Uh, but it, uh, I mean, but, but, uh, you can have JBS. I'll stick with America food group. Oh, there you go, Josh. Somebody doesn't like JBS. They think it's a bunch of BS, I guess. Uh, James, maybe two owner operators. What left over here at, um, uh, maybe two owner operators left what over at, uh, Pottsville, you said? You mean, uh, I don't, or you talking about JBS or, uh, Shannon, uh, great live show. Thanks. Hey, no, no problem, Shannon. I mean, I know you're doing a lot better, so it's, I'm glad for you that, you know, things are looking up for you. Hoping I'm not coming in all choppy. The reaper just kicked on. Yeah, I think I am. Is that better? Uh, truck and review. My company is a logistics company. We also broker loads. Ah, so maybe I should get my authority. <laughs> All right. I'm going to call it at 610. Unless somebody's got really something good to say, I guess I'm, I'm definitely going to get out of here. Cause like I said, I'll be here till like 11 o'clock. I'll be here to midnight, probably. Or I'm supposed to be delivering. Uh... Truck and reviews. JBS is our customer. Okay. Okay. James. No, not us. Two CRL owner operators going to JBS. Oh, okay. Okay.
Yeah, I don't know. I guess uh, I'm just going to see where it goes because I, I don't really, if I start jumping around now, the problem is, especially now with the way things are, whatever company really needs an owner operator or, or driver, they're going to say anything they want to you. They're going to show you anything they want. Um, and I've been down this road before where you'll jump to a company, you'll be there a month and it's, it's BS and you're already hurt. And so you, you got to put up with, you know, the shit as much as you can until you get enough to get out of there and, and so on and so forth. And I just don't want to, I don't even want I don't want to do that. Hell, I'm, I'm even, I'm at the point where if this is like a couple, if I have a couple good weeks, I might, I might reactivate my authority and put my authority on the truck as long as CRL is okay with, with doing that, um, which they were before. So I don't know why they would be any different now. And, you know, I might, like I said, if it gets slow, I'll just run some spot market freight. You know, if they don't have the loads to give me, I'll, I gotta do something. Uh, now the problem is though, I'll have to end up getting a reefer trailer here too, eventually or renting one. Which I don't know. Does I don't know if it makes that probably doesn't make much sense. So maybe I'll have to do power only. But I guess you know making some kind of money doing power only, even if it's only you know maybe I'm only growth uh, netting what seventy five cents, fifty cents, or whatever. It's better than sitting around at home not doing nothing. I guess. Truck reviews. Uh, pork costs more than chicken these days. Yeah, you are right. If pork does cost more than chicken these days. Uh, I think that. Well, I don't know. I would have thought chicken would have went up a little bit due to the bird flu crap and everything, and I guess it did, but it's just not, I don't know, it's not metabolizing uh, the way it did. And it's just, I don't know. Like I said, I still think it's the economy that's playing a role in a lot of this, unfortunately. So we'll just see how that goes. So, All right, well, I'm going to edit here. Uh, this is Jackknife TV. Thanks for stopping by and listening to my uh I don't know. Some, I guess, some advice that I, I can at least give out, or at least what's happening to me. Uh, I know everybody has things that are different. Some guys that are looking at this and are being like, "Man, I got a truck. I bought it for sixty thousand. This old, uh, this old uh, Freightliner cent uh, Century Class or Classic, and I haven't had problems with it three years." And you know what? Great for you. That's great. You've had great luck. Um, happy for you. Um, but other people just, they just have bad luck. And I guess apparently I'm one of them. Uh, it, like I said, it would be different if I know I went out and bought a brand new truck and side by side. Like I tell people don't do that when the money comes in. Uh, but I just continuously, I, I continuously have bad luck. That's really what got me bad luck. And trying to, like I said, I'm trying to pay off old debt, pay things down. And so when I did get money, I would take a decent, at least a decent amount, set it aside, and the rest I would use to pay off debt and do other things. And it's, apparently it's just not enough, you know, at least for what's been happening to me. Let's see, truck and review is I'm a company driver making 75 cents a mile. Yep. He makes six figures a year. And you know what's nice? You don't have no freaking worries. You come in, you, you do your job, and you go home. So, now that's not every company, but at least yours. Well, you've already talked to me about it on the, you know, before. But uh, let's see here. Butch Seneca is looking for owner operators for pulling open top. Open top. Uh, you mean like end dump or like drain hopper? Open top. Hey, I don't think I mean flatbed. Flatbed skateboard. Truck and reviews. Yep, I learned years ago. Yeah, no, I know. Uh, and uh, I guess I'm just, like I said, I, I ended up getting a taste of the dream. I guess it's not the dream, but I got a taste of, you know, having an employee and, and kind of felt like I might throw into something that, that, you know, you see the guy's that have the 3,000-square-foot uh, 3, houses, the bass boats and stuff, and, and you know, they got, what, a, a fleet of 20 or 30 trucks, and, you know, they're all nice KWs. Or, uh, like, like, how about this? Uh, you ever watch the uh, YouTube, and there's a, there's a channel called 
Pigeon Creek, I think, or Blue Creek or something. Creek Transport. He's up in New York. He does he does all kinds of stuff, but mostly like uh, end dump, uh, mulch, things like that. Uh, you know, look, look, look the little thing he carved out there for himself. And that's what I was hoping it was, you know, I was working into. And, you know, things and everything, you know, the engine, I uh, mean, the, the emissions problem with the truck. Um, I lost the carrier. I mean, I lost a dedicated customer, per se. And, you know, everything hurts. So, vegetable trailers. Okay. Okay. Like potatoes and stuff. Out of the field. Yep. Yeah, like I said, a lot of a lot of owner operators, you know, they don't have to grow. They do really good working for them. They do a lot of you know co-ops and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm already going over uh, 10, 10, 10. Does hurt to dream or try? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, um, man, I used to know a, a saying, or I came up with a saying. I uh, shit, I forget. It was kind of depressing though, but it uh, it it uh. It hurts to dream and try, but it doesn't hurt not to. Uh, something I remember I had it was the same when I was younger because it just always seemed like it would hit the fan. But you know, when you start thinking like that, you'll never get anywhere. And a lot of people take a big leap of faith. Uh, you know, it, it, like I look at my old man. You know, he's retired, lives in a trailer now. He's had opportunities to run a business and stuff, and he just he just always saw other people fail and then he did see p people have succeeded. Like he saw buddies of his succeed. He said the one buddy, uh, you know, Rob's towing. I mean, everybody's heard of Rob's, I guess out of Bristol. He said that guy, no matter what he did, everything he touched turned to gold and you know, it just, it just worked out for him. Butch just hold, just hold a lot of vegetables to get him where he is at. Yep. You're talking about the, the, guy hauling the vegetables out of the field uh truck and review if i got my own truck again i would be medical waste yep well, well yeah niche niche thing uh i don't know we'll see we'll see maybe maybe in a few months or a few weeks here everything will go good and i'll i won't even pretty much talk like i'm losing everything but you know we'll, we'll see how it goes it just I'm I'm used to used to shit just continuously going downhill. So I'm preparing for the worst, I guess you could say. So all right, like I said, this is Jack Knight TV. I'm gonna get out of here, so whatever comment pops up, I'll read it. That's you know, maybe elaborate on it real quick. That's it. So thanks for stopping by. If you can, you know, smash the freaking like button on the way out. Uh you know, if you like any of the comment I put you know, yeah, content, content that I put out here. Uh, you know, subscribe. I, I know I'm not no just trucking or anything, but uh, you know, one day, one day, you know, I'll get my old lady a boot job and uh, I'll buy some cool cars. And stuff. <laughs> I sure would love to help you. I know she. <laughs> I just, I don't know. It's just, it is. What it is. I'm not. I'm not making fun. I'm just saying that. Uh, hopefully no one's taking that. I'm just saying that I, I would love to be in the same shoes as he's in. Perhaps I know he's worked there and he's a nice guy and stuff. I know a lot of people. A lot of people hate on people like that, but generally he's from everyone I've ever talked to. He's generally a, a nice, upstanding guy. So, um, thanks, thanks, Josh. Uh, Reed, good evening, Jack Knife. Why don't you get into heavy haul? Uh. It's expensive, and a lot of the companies and people I know that I've had connections with that have gotten into heavy haul have kind of, you know, you expect to make a certain amount going in, as, even as a company driver, and they've kind of fell very short and got lied to with a lot of stuff. But, I mean, maybe I'm just not, I never talked to the right company or anything or did that. Uh, you know, I would love to do that myself, but it's just you got a, you got a lot of overhead. You know, trailers cost a lot. Uh, your responsibility is a lot more. The insurance, especially your authority insurance, is a lot more, a little more uh, temperamental too. But if uh, if you want to make the money, come pull my extra uh, bull uh, what bull rock bull rock R A. Oh, it's an R A. Bull rack. Okay. Uh, I, don't know. I never I never hauled bull, but uh, you know I would be up to anything. 
Uh, especially, like I said, especially if I got my own authority, I would be up to anything. So, so I don't know. We'll see how things go. If I can kind of pull out of this a little bit, maybe I'm going to try to get my own authority. To be honest, it's very easy, per se, to get your authority. I know a lot of people say it's a little bit of pain in the ass, but if you just read, read the FMCSA thing, pay the $300, and just go down the list of stuff that you've got to do. It's you can it, the big the big things that cost money is the insurance. Depending where you're at, you know. So I I need like two thousand dollars down for insurance again, and the uh, the plates Pennsylvania plates for uh, uh, what do they call them permanent plates or I can't believe I haven't had to talk about it in a while. But the plates for Pennsylvania are like twenty eight hundred dollars I think a year. So, you know, you got to have at least a couple thousand bucks sitting around. And right now, I don't want to try to do that. Um, that would not be a good mood if, if things don't work out for me, you know. Uh, uh, Reed, I did uh, utility poles, and I did do oversize. I did, like, 120-foot-long utility poles. Um, so, I mean, I do, I do have the experience. I know the permitting process. Uh, the stuff that's really big, I mean, I never got into, like, like, I mean, I guess I did 14 foot wide um, truss and stuff like that. But most of that was already, you know, uh, blanket permits and stuff. It was, oh, we didn't even freaking run pilot cars. And that was more of a company. I, I mean, probably some of those we should have, but that was more of a company decision than my decision, really. Sorry, I meant oversized, not so much heavy haul. Uh, I mean, you know, I could probably easily get into heavy haul, but I mean, it's, it's just really the permitting process. It's a little more complicated with the weights and, you know, um, your axles and all that. Uh, but hauling cattle isn't hard. Just have to be good with uh, with time. Uh, paying over $7 a mile right now. No, I know. I imagine cattle pays well. Or I know, uh, what's his name? Uh Tim Gentry, I know he would he would not have got into it unless cattle paid well. So, all right, I'm going to get out of here. Like I said, I'll sit here like another thirty or thirty minutes or something talking. Um, but hey, like I said, thanks guys, thanks for all the comments for coming in here and you know all your insight and you know thank you for letting me feel at least my opinions on, on this industry and, and at least how I feel about it. So, uh, this is Jack Knight TV. Um. I'm pretty much out. I'll see you guys.